Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's July 24th, 2023, Pioneer Day in Utah. And today we are going to be talking about uh, what I think is a really interesting Mormon story. Uh, what happens when you are an adolescent and young adult who loves math and you're kind of uh, into math competitions. You're raised a devout Mormon. And uh, as you start advancing into high school, you end up being faced with the choice. Do I serve a Mormon mission or do I, do I go to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology? Not that it's always a zero sum game. Some people do both, but uh, that's going to be kind of the teaser for today's interview. We're going to be interviewing James Camacho. Is that how you pronounce it, James? Yep. And James is uh, not to give it away, but he's currently at MIT. Is that right? That's that's right. So I guess we'll uh, we'll find out whether we served a mission or not. But uh, I uh, I was particularly interested in this story because I worked for MIT for uh, several years on as a part of the Open Courseware Consortium, and um, yeah, MIT obviously is uh, one of the world's most well known and uh, well respected science, technology, and engineering universities. So. Um, James, I'm super excited to have you on Mormon Stories today. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. And uh, also joining us in studio is um, my brilliant and wise partner in truth and righteousness, Margie. Hey, Margie. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thanks for joining us. So happy to be here. Yeah, happy happy Pioneer Day. <laughs> Thanks so much. For all the different types of pioneers. That's right, all the different pioneering yeah. going on in the world right now. Yeah. All right. So... Uh, Let's just dive right in, James. Are, is there any, are there any disclaimers you want to first provide about why you wanted to do this interview, kind of what your intentions are or are not? Um, no, I don't really think I have a disclaimer. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, maybe uh, part of why I wanted to do it is uh, I felt very alone growing up. Uh, I, I had like a twin brother who was similarly into math and stuff. But other than him, like none of my peers really cared about math. Uh and then when I began questioning the uh, stuff as I grew up, uh, like I, I didn't have anyone else to talk to because I was used to talking like with a lot more rigor, uh, but like I could only talk to my brother. So mm -hmm. yeah, so you want other people to be able to have stories they can learn from and not feel so alone. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. And you're currently going to be entering your sophomore year at MIT, is that right? Yep. And what are you, what are you studying? So right now, uh, I am planning on majoring in machine learning. Uh, so that's mainly just because uh, I want to graduate as quick as possible. Uh, so uh, I've taken already a bunch of math courses. Uh, so really, like, I know most of the math that I need to graduate. I just need to get, like, the credits and the classes done. Got it. Okay. So you want to do AI, basically? Um, yeah, AI is decently interesting. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about AI a little bit. Since. That wasn't okay. a hard sell. <laughs> decently interesting. <laughs> well, okay. It's like, uh, right now it's just such a soft science. So AI is? Yeah. And like yeah. the current research isn't that great, but, mm -hmm. but th that's my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to fix that? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> We'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive in. Where does your Mormon story begin, James? Uh, let's see. Like, were I you guess, born into the church? Yeah, I, I was born into the church. Uh, so, D tell us really quickly. Like, what did your parents? Were they born into the church? Did they? Where did they meet? Did they serve missions? Yeah. Did they get married in the temple? That sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, my mom is like seventh generation Mormon. Uh, my dad is like I don't know what generation. Uh, I know he, my grandpa. Uh, was really active, but I don't think his dad was. So probably like third. Um, uh, let's see. So they both went to BYU. Uh, that's where they met. That's where they got married. Um, they got married in the Provo Temple. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. And do you want to talk about kind of either their professions? Oh, yeah. So, okay. Uh, my mom had children pretty young. I think like 22 or 23 was her first child. Um, and so she's just been a stay at home mom for basically my whole life. Actually, no, for my whole life. Uh, my dad, uh, got a PhD in physics. So that was like for first five years of life. Where from? Uh, 
What? Where do you, where do you go? Uh, University of Rochester. Okay. New York? Uh, yeah, New York. Uh, and then we moved around a little bit for like postdoc and then like a job at in New Mexico. Uh, eventually, uh, when right about as I was getting into my teen years, uh, we moved to Provo and he worked at, started working for BYU uh, as a professor in electrical engineering. So. Margie and I participated in what they call Barbenheimer this weekend, where we saw Barbie and Oppenheimer. <laughs> were you in Los Alamos when you were in New Mexico? No, we were uh, in Albuquerque, which Albuquerque. is like two or three hours north. Which university was was there? Is that so, so oh, uh, my dad was actually working for Santa National Labs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So federal government stuff. Yeah. Okay. So your dad heavily into science and engineering. Yep. So okay. like. He, he was teaching me math when I was like five, so I got a head start there. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. How many kids did your parents have? Uh, let's see. So I ha there's a total of five of us. Okay. Uh, I have one older brother, a twin brother, a younger brother, and then a little sister. Okay. And uh, were was your family kind of active and faithful in the church growing yeah. up? Yeah, very active. Like We'd go to church on vacations. Um, let's see. Uh, pretty orthodox. Uh, I know. So th there's always like a couple families that I'd be like, well, they're a little more orthodox, but like th th there's like what the same five families. We were probably one of them. Mm -hmm. What year were you born? Uh, 2003. 2003. So. Mormon story started in 2005. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> wow. So you're uh, young. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Wait, I think I'm. That, that, that makes me old. I'm older than Mormon <laughs> stories. You're two years older than Mormon stories. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what are you saying there? If, if that makes you old, that, that makes us really old. Huh? <laughs> well, I'm just we don't mind. You just started Mormon stories when you're pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. So, um, okay. So your early years were in New Mexico. Is that right? Uh Let's see, yeah, probably, like, I, my childhood growing up was New Mexico, and then, like, uh, coming into age would be Utah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, there are all the markers and milestones of kind mm -hmm. of, a, of a young Mormon family growing up with five kids. Did you guys uh, strive for those markers? Like, baptism, all that. Family home evening, family home evening. prayer, okay. family prayer, scripture study, uh, all that. Let's see. Our parents were actually not so great at organizing family prayer and scripture reading. So we probably did scripture reading like 50% of the time. Um, That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and then let's see. Family home evening. Uh, I think we used to do it on Mondays, but then uh, we started just doing it like after church. Because it was easier than getting everyone, like as we were growing up, doing different activities, mm. it's easier to get everyone together on Sunday. And did you guys attend church all all the hours and all the hours? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, were there rules in your Mormon family home that kind of made you as kids different from your peers in terms of what you were and weren't allowed to do compared mm. to your peers? Uh, I mean, like we couldn't hang out on Sundays. Uh, with friends? Yeah, like with friend with friends. Um let's see. Obviously like the word of wisdom. So like uh, I remember going to one friend's birthday party and they like iced tea. I'm like, oh I can't drink that. Um but I didn't feel like there's a bunch of rules. Um Our, what about R rated movies or swearing? Oh, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. I, like well, I never really liked swearing to begin with. Okay. So uh, I didn't really care about that. Uh and yeah, no R-rated movies, but like, um, oh, actually also no PG-13 movies. Uh, up mm. until we were like 16, we oh. had to go ask our parents, like, are we allowed to watch this movie? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Okay. That, yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm curious if, is your mom math and science oriented, STEM oriented? or um, I think she's kind of, I don't. I don't think it. I think like her family in general is math STEM oriented, but like I, I don't think she's super into it. Okay, I'm curious how and if kind of a science mentality, at least on your dad's part, jived with your Mormonism growing up. Did it ever? Was there ever any tension there 
at least in those childhood years between, because some say mm-hmm. science and religion sometimes are like oil and water a little bit. Yeah. Was there ever any of that? Um, not really. Uh, let's see. Like in, in my younger years, Mormonism wasn't a huge role in my life. Uh, so, mm-hmm. hmm. Like we didn't talk about it a ton outside of Sunday. Um, mm-hmm. Hmm. I mean, as I grew older, obviously he 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 wanted like to talk about uh, more get get more into like the deep doctrine, uh, read commentaries on Bible verses. But this was like later teen years, okay. so not Early not like years. young childhood. Yeah. yeah. When you remember, kind of growing up as a let's just say a younger. Boy, so this would be in Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. Um, like, what do you remember about yourself? Like, you did you love math then? Um, like, what did you what do you remember about you as a boy? What you liked to do? What your days were like? How you felt? Yeah, let's see. Um, so actually, uh, very early childhood, I was actually a chess kid. Oh, um, yeah. So I would play chess with my twin brother. Uh, so we started in kindergarten and we just played a bunch against each other because we were the same level. Like that, that's the best way to improve. So, well, maybe it's not, maybe you also have to solve tactics, but I quit when I was like third grade. Um, <laughs> cause we had to wake up a little early to go to chess club. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so that was like, uh, very young years. Uh, so, uh, and then in like third grade, I, start, I started doing math uh, and I was definitely a math kid. So like mm-hmm. uh, I remember in fifth grade, we would actually go to uh, we, we would leave our elementary school to go to local middle school uh, and like to take algebra there. So mm-hmm. definitely a lot of time spent on math. Um, and then that's also like when I started getting into math competitions. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, so um so math competitions, talk about that. Okay. Well, there, there's a lot to talk about. That Mostly uh, middle school. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, so in fourth and fifth grade, uh, there's this thing called math olympiads for elementary and middle schoolers. Uh, so I did that in fourth and fifth grade. Uh, I didn't really care, though, about math competitions back then. It's just like uh, we just did it in class uh, once a week. Um, I'm like... So, so I cared enough, like, I wanted to solve all the problems, uh, but, like, th- th- that was about it. Um, so I was, like, uh, but then, like, in middle school, there's this national competition called Math Counts, which is a lot bigger, uh, a lot more important, and uh, I really wanted to do well in this. Uh, so my brother and I were pretty competitive, like, with chess, uh, and then it became math. Your twin brother or yeah. your older brother? My, okay. my twin brother. Okay. Um, so basically I wanted to do at least as well as he did. Uh, so, uh, in, in sixth grade, we had an hour off in school where we just did like our own math thing, uh, because like our school only had algebra. We'd already taken that. Uh, so, uh, we, we both just like spent the hour studying for math counts. So we would do a bunch of practice problems. Uh, and I learned a bunch of math in that time. So... That, that was really good. Um, anyways, though, uh, apparently my brother uh, wanted to, like, win state. Uh, I didn't know this until, like, a week before the state competition. Um, but Math Counts has, like, a bunch of different competitions. So there's, like, first the, the school round, uh, where it's just, like, against your school. Uh, and then, like, the top ten from there go to the chapter round. Um, it depends on the chapter. Uh, in New Mexico, about the top 50% from each chapter go, down, go on to state. But that's just because New Mexico is, like, a really small state. Um, so, anyways, in the school round, Joseph beat me by a little bit, uh, which is a little sad. But, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, uh, same for chapter round. But in the chapter round, Joseph ended up getting first. So, uh, so like, that, that was that's super impressive uh, as a sixth grader. Uh, You're competing against... So older what? kids. Yeah, yeah. So sixth, seventh, and eighth graders oh, are competing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So uh, also, our chapter was like the hardest chapter in the state. So mm. that means he was probably first in the state. Mm. Um, so I ended up getting fourth, which I was like super happy about until I learned he got first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but and what uh, types of questions or problems is it? Just like here's a piece of paper with problems. Okay. Yeah, who yeah. can who can 
complete them and fastest and get them right? Or? Um, so it's, <clears throat> it's a timed test. So it's like you have 30 problems in 40 minutes. Uh, there's actually, th that's like called the sprint round. Uh, Cause it's like you only have 80 seconds per question. Then there's also like the target round, which is you have like three minutes per problem. So you get a little longer. Um, what kinds of questions? So uh, it, it's supposed to be middle school math, which means uh, uh, only algebra, geometry, whatever. But like in truth, you actually have to use like roots of unity filters and lots of other stuff. Um, right. So, yeah. Roots of unity filters, Martin? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, do, do you want me to explain that? Sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, like, if you have a polynomial, uh, a, like, a naught plus a1x plus a2x squared, uh, where, like, a naught, whatever, and a1 are just some coefficients, uh, you can use, like, these roots of unity to filter out all, uh, all the powers of x except, like, x to the fifth. So, like, a fifth root of unity is, like, a complex number so that, like... Uh, C, z, sorry, z to the fifth would equal one. So, like, obviously one is a root of unity, but, like, you can also have, like, cosine of uh, pi over five, sorry, two pi over five plus i sine two pi over five. And that's, like, also if you put that to the fifth power is equal to one. So anyways, if you add, like, uh, f of one plus f of z plus f of z squared plus dot 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 plus f of z to the fourth, uh, everything will cancel out except the powers of five. So... Nice. Can I ask you a question about your brain and math in particular? Yeah. Like, do you remember, well, I guess it could be not even when you were young, but how would you describe your brain's relationship to, like, math? Is it like mm. a language that you learn? What, did it feel familiar to you? Um, did it feel in, like, kind of, or did it feel sort of like um, a puzzle? Mm that you're given sort of some tools to figure out and then you, like how would you describe how your brain related to math? Okay, so I, I think actually I'm not naturally as good at math as like other subjects. It's just, it ended up being the one that I had to work hardest on. Um, but hmm. I, I think uh, when it comes to the competition problems, it's like a puzzle because uh, like usually competition problems have uh, relatively quick solutions, but the hard part is finding the way to get there. Um, when it comes like to the rest of math, learning it, uh, I try to think of it as like uh, whatever math c exists, it made sense to somebody at some point. So I just need to figure out like from first principle, from first principles, like how did they get there? So like with the roots of unity filter, you start out with you want everything you want it to cancel if it's like actually I'm not even going to talk about that. Yeah. But yeah. so so that's what I try to do. I try to like say, okay, how does this make sense? Um, Got it. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. That makes sense. Are you done? Can I ask a quick question sure. going yeah. off on a, um, and if you don't want to talk about this, this is absolutely mm -hmm. great. I was curious just um, how you would describe your experience having a twin mm. growing up. So I don't have experience not having a twin. So, mm -hmm. um, is it a fraternal or a maternal twin? Uh, nocturnal. Okay. Meaning? Uh, I identical. <laughs> but I guess what I'm curious about is, like, did you experience being kind of grouped together, interchangeable? Oh. Um, kind of those kind of those things. D did you experience it as, like, very mixed or really largely positive because you had this uh, person yeah. in the world that, you know, kind of came into the world yeah. with you, like just some of your, how you think about it. So, so I think like, uh, up until ninth grade, I would say actually up until maybe even 11th grade, I would say like, I perceived it as negative, uh, because all the time people would ask me the dumbest twin questions. Like, can you guys read each other's mind? It's just like, Maybe you only see twins like once a year, but I have to live with this every single day. It's mm -hmm. so annoying. Um, and then also just like uh, because we were twins, we were able to be so much more competitive. Like with my older and younger siblings, uh, like, like, okay, especially like younger siblings, uh, they, they can't compete against you because you have years of experience ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So, So kind of all I'm hearing kind of intensity because there's – that yeah. peer. Yeah. Mm. I see. 
So you guys were pretty competitive with each other? Uh, yeah, very competitive. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of blame uh, my dad a little for this because, like, failing was not an option, and we both knew it. <laughs> and so, like, even getting second place was which is like so dumb because like one of us had to get second place every single year. So <laughs> there's some inevitability there. Yeah. Going but on. like we would be so disappointed if we ever got second place. Mm. So did you, did you feel a lot of um, like when you think back to your competitions at that age, did, do you, did you feel a lot of pressure or were you excited or both? Let's see. So I think, uh, sixth grade, I was, uh, very much excited until the state competition, like, because until chapter, I didn't really know how well we would rank. Um, and then seventh grade, very excited. Eighth grade was just like very stressful because it was my last year. Uh, mm, yeah. very much pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Okay. So you both entered that sixth grade competition and both did super well. Yeah. And uh, where did that take you? Okay, so, I, so, the, so the chapter round, Joseph got first, I got fourth. Um, I'm like, okay, I needed to do, so the top four make it to nationals. So I'm like, I could make it to nationals. And just as for sure going to nationals, that means like, even if I don't win, I have to at least make it to the national competition. So, um, so I, like, I studied a bunch more. State competition was a month away. Uh, so we ended up doing it. Uh, it didn't go too great, but... How many hours, like a day or a week, as so, a sixth grader, were you studying math? Uh, probably like one to, to two hours a day. Okay. Um, not on Sundays, though, because like <laughs> that, that was like Mormon rule. <laughs> to be clear. Yeah, yeah. You don't work on Sundays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so anyways, the state competition came around. Uh, I tied for second place with two other people. So it wow. was Joseph got first. Uh, second, third, and fourth, we both got like 32 points. And then fifth place got 31 points. So I just barely squeaked it. Okay. Um, so I was like very happy about that. I didn't even care about the national competition. <laughs> but so it, it worked out. Um, seventh grade, we got first and second again. I got second. Hmm. I should have gotten first. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then eighth grade, I ended up getting first. But that was like the most stressful comp day of competition. Hmm. How uh, did y'all do at nationals? So... Sixth and seventh grades, we didn't really care because we had, like, more years. Um, uh, in eighth grade, we wanted to make top 12 because top 12, like, so there's, like, the sprint and target round. There's also a countdown round, which is, like, for the very top uh, people where it's, like, uh, you're pitted head-to-head -head against each other. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. like, kind of like Jeopardy. Um, it's, like, first to buzz in uh, and answer it right gets the points. So uh, we wanted to make countdown round, which is top 12. Uh, but this is, of course, across the nation. Uh and New Mexico, it's not a very competitive state. Uh, so we we didn't make countdown round ever, which is sad. Uh, that sounds so intense, by it, the way. The countdown round? Yeah. Oof. I mean, like, there's also countdown round at state. Uh, oh, that was actually kind of intense <laughs> in eighth grade. So I, I, I need to actually clarify this a little. Uh, we moved to Utah in eighth grade. So uh, in Utah, the countdown round is official, as in... Uh, it counts for your ranking. So if you end up getting fourth uh, in the written competition, but then like lose in the countdown round and end up fifth place, uh, you would not go to nationals. Oh, so wow. it was like a lot more uh -huh. uh, yeah, stressful that way. Anyways, so yeah, countdown round was kind of stressful. Uh, so we, we didn't make countdown round in nationals, but like we did really well. We got I got like 30th place, Joseph got like 35th. So y'all um, were in the top 50 yeah. math students in the nation. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> There's only 50 states, right? So Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. really cool. I think we could have done better. Like, we were just really stressed the yeah. whole day. Yeah. But that makes sense. It is what it is. And uh, was it the type of thing where your parents or your ward, you know, your family was super proud of you both? or? Um, Not really. No? Like, okay, when we... <laughs> Every time we, like, placed a certain place, like, well, once we d got first and second in state, that was just the expected from then on. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, like, I, I feel like our parents just kind of expected us to make Canton round, hmm. and then we didn't. So, <laughs> hmm. um, I, I'm sure they were, like, proud of how well we did, but, like, kind of wanted us to do better. Hmm. 
Were your other siblings, older and younger, also interested in STEM kind of stuff? So uh, my older brother didn't do math as much. Uh, he did the geography B. Uh, oh, okay. So in elementary, middle school, he got like second in state, oh. but only first goes to nationals in that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm. So, so it sounds like academics was highly emphasized in your family. Yes. Yeah. And it was public schools, not private schools or homeschool. Yeah, it was public schools. Okay. Um, like, let's see. Oh, yeah. I, I remember our dad like told us one time, uh, you can choose, w when you go to college, you can choose any major as long as it's uh, a hard science. Oh. <laughs> mm. So... Yeah. Strong preferences there. So, like, our older brother was probably a little disappointed uh, mm -hmm. because, like, the family culture was very mathy, science-y. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did get into that eventually, but just, like, years after us because he was doing geography B in middle okay. school. Got it. So. What, what have you ever – so, again, you can decline if you want. But uh, what what's the reasoning behind hard science only? Is it like a superiority? Like he feels like they're superior to or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they kind of are like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, he's an English major. <laughs> but, I mean, when it comes to like applications, uh, if you're trying to build a computer, like you need to know electrical engineering uh, and math and physics. So like <laughs> almost all technology comes from the hard science. Actually, let's. All technology comes from the hard sciences. So. <laughs> if you want to build, he said, if you want to build stuff, Margie, you need the science. So, the hard science. There <laughs> are many things that make this world go round. But here's what I'll say. Here's what I'll say. Like, so was your dad, would you say, very involved in your process of these math? Um, competitions or was he more hands off and you'd come home and tell him and then you would experience um, kind of if there was some type of disappointment or like okay. how would you describe his involvement? I, I, I would say he would say he was very hands on. I would say that uh, he was kind of hands on, but like it was mostly me and Joseph just doing our own thing. OK, um, so like he was our math counts coach in middle school, oh. uh, which I mean, oh. meant he ran, ran the club, but that also meant like he was mostly uh talking to the other students there because Joseph and I were just like doing our own thing. Yeah. Um, so up until about like sixth, sixth grade, seventh grade, he did teach us some math, uh, actually a lot of math. Um, but after like seventh grade, it was just, we More were kind of on our own. own. Yeah. And then switching from the, the move from New Mexico to Utah, was that kind of a switch up as to level or... Difficulty how many people, mean? yes, like difficulty. And also, I don't know how many people, were there more people in competitions or how did yeah. it affect your experience in eighth grade to move? So uh, the so in eighth grade, I got a lot better because there was like no one else around me who cared about math. So like, uh, so in terms of the levels, New Mexico and Utah are about the same. Uh, okay on in math counts competitiveness but uh in new mexico i was at uh the middle school that had like all the top students so uh like we had like nine of the top 10 uh oh. places at state so basically like all my friends in middle school were also into math and like when i went to math counts club we could socialize more uh so i probably didn't try very as hard though in seventh grade because I was socializing more at math club instead of like studying. Yeah. But uh, it, it was a lot nicer. It was like a community, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. 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 And then when I moved to like Utah, uh, it was just kind of me and my brother, that's it. Uh, we went home early from school to like do our own math uh, and science studying. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and so basically, uh, it, it, we studied probably like two hours, maybe three hours on average a day for math then because like we didn't have any friends. <laughs> we just like got, because like we were only at school half the time. So we just like got home, studied math, studied math more. <laughs> so what about like music or sports or mm -hmm. other s social things? Yeah. Sports uh, wasn't a big thing in our family. Uh, in high school, we were told like we had to do a sport. But before then, not really. Uh, actually, we did do like swim team for a couple years, and but I didn't really enjoy it. So uh, when it comes to music, 
uh, our mom was uh, felt that was very important. So uh, we started learning violin and piano like six or seven years old. Um, but we actually, uh, my twin and I quit uh, quit piano in, when we got to middle school. So like we could just focus on math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, did your family's relationship with the church change coming to Utah? And then I know a major theme in kind of the essay you sent me was fitting in culturally with the kids in Utah, yeah. even though you were Mormon, you know, and I'll say a white Mormon because I think that plays in <laughs> yeah. to the essay you wrote. Weirdly, as a white Mormon kid, struggling more to fit in in Utah than in New Mexico. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, part of the reason our mom wanted to move to Utah so much is because we have, like, family here, but also because it's, like, the Mormon bubble. Uh, but uh, when we actually ended up getting to Utah, uh, Mormonism is a lot more social uh, and liberal, especially, like, right around BYU uh, with all the professors. So uh, our mom was certainly disappointed about that. Um, that it was more liberal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you say liberal, what do you mean and what did your mom mean? Okay, so uh, I am trying to use like the same definition my mom would use. So like people who would advocate for women in the priesthood or uh, LGBT rights um, and so on. And like she was very conservative in that regard. The prophets are right kind of deal. Um, so she would like complain about the other people in our ward. Uh, like, oh, and then also like, um, I also said it was like a lot more social as in people would just like come to church for the community um, versus back in New Mexico, the only people who would come to church were like the people who are really into the church. So people would go to church, sure for community, but also like to put in their work and callings and whatever. So that also bothered my mom. Um, I didn't really care too much because like, I didn't have a call, you know, I was just a teen. Uh, but I did hear, but it, it, it did bug me a little uh, going into the youth, uh, in the youth groups where like we didn't have stuff ever planned. Uh, in New Mexico, people were a lot better at planning stuff. So. Hmm. so it sounds like your mom was very orthodox, meaning f I don't want to say fundamentalist in her beliefs, but but pretty conservative. conservative in her yeah. religious beliefs. Um, my dad's the same way, but uh, I think he's more willing to uh, at least like think about other ideas. Yeah. Were you ever called a nerd in middle school or high school? Were you ever bullied, mistreated, or were you super mm. respected and valued for mm. your love of, of science or love yeah. of math? So I, I don't think I was ever bullied. Uh, I just, I, I didn't give people the time to do that. I like, like it, when people, okay. I remember like one time someone came up to me and was like, multiply these two big numbers. And it's just like, whatever. Uh, so I just like ignored people like that. Um, I think lots of people did respect me. Uh, I did get called nerd a lot, uh, but it was more of in a friendly way. Um, I still didn't like it though. So <laughs> And is that for someone who's really good at math, kind of competing at the national levels? Can't is that the type of thing you could do? Is multiply two large numbers in your in your head or not? No, okay. I mean, like I could do it a lot better than most people, but it's not like I've trained for that. So, like five <laughs> digits times five digits—that's not the type of thing. No, you could I could do. do like three digits times three digits, mm -hmm. and like it would take me a couple minutes. But you're like oh. <laughs> living your day, and the people are like, perform, go, yeah, yeah, perform yeah, for yeah, us. It was just like funny, like that. That's what people thought. Uh, uh, especially in like sixth grade, this is what people thought uh, the math meant. And I'm like, no, it's like there's so much more to it. <laughs> yeah. How wh wh how would you describe what it means? If um, it's not, you know, being able to multiply large numbers in your head. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that's just like arithmetic. And yeah. it, it, it's like just a skill you have to have. But uh, I kind of think of math as an art um, and it's like trying to fit. Uh, or hmm, trying to make hmm, a achieve something like within the math with the simplest and like most beautiful way possible. So, hmm, math is an art. Yeah, 
that, that wasn't a great explanation, but no, there's an elegance to yeah. figure. It's like a puzzle figuring out the simplest way. Yeah. The most efficient way to do a calculation maybe, or to or arrive uh, at an answer. Or, or yeah. Uh, like to solve a problem. Like I, I kind of think of it, you have some problem you want to solve and like, how do you go about solving it? Uh, or at least that's applied maths. Then there's like theoretical math, which I don't really like, but that's very much more in the artsy category. <laughs> okay, so up with applied math, is do you get to a place where you can have a problem and actually use a number of different, there are a number of different ways you can go about actually solving a single problem? I mean... Or is there a right, a kind of the correct way? Uh, okay, usually it's like uh, you think about it and you're like, hmm... You know, I'm just going to use like an analogy for like, hmm, no, I don't know how to explain this. So I, I think there is like a right way, but it's kind of like the obvious way to go about it. You just have to find the obvious way. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you're like trying to find, so, so a determinant is basically a volume. Um, and if you're trying to find the volume of something like, if you just go down to like, what does volume even mean? Uh, then it becomes like super obvious how to do this. Uh, and so like, there is one right way, but mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, hmm. So what? I, I don't think that was a great explanation. No, that's okay. Yeah. No, I, I think we're getting a sense for, for what yeah, you're talking you're about. You're doing great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if your mom is really orthodox, your dad is a little bit more open, and then you move to a Provo ward where your dad's going to work for BYU, mm -hmm. I assume. And it's kind of, I often liken coming to Utah as a Mormon from out of state as like coming to Oz, where you, meet the, <laughs> you, know, you think you're going to meet the wizard and you think you're going to be in Emerald City where everything's super Mormon and super perfect. Was it a culture shock for you? Was it awesome? Was it everything you dreamed of as a Mormon kid? It, it was a huge culture shock. In a good like, way or a bad way? In, in a bad way. Okay. How so? <laughs> uh, like how so? I felt like uh, the, the the Mormons were less Mormon, like less pure Mormon, mm -hmm. less Orthodox Mormon in Utah. Uh, and then like just also all the other things I cared about, no one else cared about in Utah. So like Mormonism was a decently big part of my life, but like the, the biggest parts of my life, like math and science, like no one cared about in Utah. Um, mm. So th th that's not quite true. We actually did have one guy in my ward uh, who made nationals uh, like a couple of years before me. So, so in, in my Utah ward. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, but like uh, his parents were very liberal and my parents were like, you shouldn't talk to him. Or like, mm. And also like, he, he was older than me, so I didn't hang out too much with him anyway. But. So, so like, on average, you're saying Utah high school kids cared less about math than New Mexico high school kids? Uh, yeah, I guess it started in eighth grade. But okay. Yeah. Okay. A, a, a lot less, so. <laughs> and do you know why that, did you, have a, did you ever get a sense, did you ask around? Did you ever try and figure out why that was? So I was like very confused for three years uh, because it's like in the Doctrine and Covenants, seek out learning out of every good book. Uh, like education is a huge thing in Mormonism. Uh, like the BYU Pathways program, they keep, and it, so there's so many general conference talks about how like you need to get an education and learn and whatever. So I was so confused. Uh, because, like, I would go and tell my friends, like, hey, do you want to learn some math? And, like, everyone said no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was, like, very confused for several years. Um, I think, like, I have an explanation now for why. Like, now I think it's because uh, people who uh, are very rigorous, uh, learn lots of math and science, end up going to, like, out of state for college um, or just, like, thinking about everything a little more rigorously. Uh, and then like they dive into, di sorry, dive into the deep doctrine of the church uh, and uh, become a lot more nuanced or leave Mormonism. So they kind of apply the intellectual rigor that they learn in math or science yeah. to Mormon doctrine, history, and theology. And maybe they don't always fare well as yeah. Orthodox believing Mormons. 
Yeah. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, that, that, that's what I think. So I, I would call it evaporative cooling because it's like all the smartest people end up uh, leaving. And so like what ends up happening is uh, the parents who could best teach their children math and science aren't uh, going to teach them Mormonism as well. And when you say, and, and I, this is an interesting part of the conversation. We'll probably return to it, but there's probably different types of intelligence. I think this is kind of what Margie was alluding to when, yeah, when yeah. she talked about, you know, English versus math, for example. Yeah. Because there are plenty of super highly intelligent. Well, first of all, there's plenty of super bright people. Yes. That just either aren't interested in math and science yes. or aren't good in math and science, but they're brilliant in other ways. Like maybe yeah. they could win a national spelling bee, but not be great at math. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yes. But... um but also what I've noticed is that while the Mormon church does really encourage education, it's not uh, an education in philosophy or an education in biology per se. It's more <laughs> like whatever would get you to be a dentist, whatever would get you to be um, an orthodontist or an attorney or an accountant. Yeah. Okay. The types of, and, and there, are, there is some science and math in that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's sort of a means to an end to what I would say is kind of a highly lucrative career, mm -hmm. but not one that that is prone to lead to to deep questions. Like studying yeah. teeth isn't necessarily <laughs> going to yes. get you to the point of like questioning the philosophical yeah. foundations or, or the truth claims of your faith. Yeah. So a lot to unpack there. Uh, first, like I totally agree. Uh, there's tons of bright people who do not care about math and science. And honestly, I probably would have ended up like be, ended up being one of them, maybe an artist or pianist or something, if not for like my family culture being super math science heavy. Um, and because my family culture was super math and science heavy, uh, when I, I, I always interpreted uh, get an education as like get an education and learn as much math and science as you can. So, uh, but I, I guess it does make sense. There are a ton of dentists and doctors and like in my extended family, like most of them care a lot about math and science, but uh, most of them are not mathematicians or scientists. So that's interesting. Yeah. And there's all sorts of other disciplines that would not be well suited for a long-term Orthodox faith, geology, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, psychology, sociology, many, many academic disciplines that just wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. be compatible with a long-term Orthodox Mormon faith. I mean, not and necessarily some would say biology. True. Some would say biology, like, right? Like, yeah, not necessarily because like, uh, there's obviously biology professors at BYU, so some people make it work. Yeah, um, yeah. But like you were saying, there there might be a lot to get weeded out. I would also add like yeah. archaeology, anthropology, you yeah. know, history. <laughs> those are perilous. Those could be perilous disciplines, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, especially one issue, though, with the hard sciences is like the rigor there is so much more than almost any other subject. And so, so name some of the hard sciences you. Oh, so I, I consider the hard sciences uh, physics. Uh, let's see. Chemistry, kind of, uh, electrical engineering. Um, and then math isn't a hard science, but it is very rigorous. So Okay. I, I don't consider what about bio biology? No, I don't consider that a hard science. Okay. Um, because but like math? Yeah, for yeah. Sure. Okay. So like, because like biology, uh, you don't really understand on the fundamental level how proteins work. You just kind of like, it's a little more wishy-washy there. Interesting. Okay. It is interesting. So when you're talking about being a lover of math and science, the science that you love, is it physics and, or <laughs> yeah. do you love biology too, so, but you just, like, how would you talk mm. about the science part that you love? So I, I actually kind of like a lot of different subjects. So uh, w when it comes to science, what I like about math and science is trying to uh, find the simplest solution to something. So, uh, or like, hmm. for, for example, like one day I was just like trying to think, uh, if you have a bar magnet, uh, what temperature does it start to denature at? Uh, and like, then you can imagine, so how a bar magnet works is you have like a bunch of electrons that have their spins pointing the same direction. Um, so, and they're all aligned in the same direction, but like as the temperature increases, they will randomly flip 
directions more and more. So mm -hmm. I was just like trying to figure this out. Uh, uh, after a certain critical point, critical temperature, uh, they'll just be completely random. That's what it means like to be denatured, won't stick to anything. Um, so like, uh, what I like about math and science is like coming up with a problem. Wh what does what temperature does this denature? And then like breaking it down into like, okay, we have these spins. Uh, has this probability based on this temperature? Um, mm -hmm. And like, you can just like figure out the exact values. Yeah, yeah. I'm connecting with the process of yeah. like what you love about each. What are the sciences that give you that? So uh, I think it's mostly physics. So I, I actually haven't branched too much into uh, the science realm. So. Uh, I'm mostly a math and computer science guy. Um, okay. Computer science, though, like it's a hard science. Uh, but let's see, it's just it's it's not the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, like particle physics, if that's what that's called, it's it's basically understanding that is as deeply mm -hmm. and as intricately as you can the nature of reality, yeah. right? The yeah. nature of things. And then if you do that, you, like you can figure everything else out. Yeah, Just foundational. From, it's really yeah. foundational. It's kind of the discipline of getting to the roots of how things yes. really work. Yeah. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And you like that. Yeah. But once you once you start doing that, it can become contagious for all other aspects of your life, right? Uh yes. <laughs> okay, wait, I have one last question before cause we will you put a pin in that. Okay. So you you've alluded to your family culture a couple mm -hmm. times, saying your family culture is kind of what really influenced you going into math and sciences. Uh huh. Would you say, just within the Mormon, I'm trying to understand the Mormon context within a home, was that did your mom share in that? Because you've kind of talked about your mom in a way of like not necessarily herself valuing or being what how did you say it with her um but your dad definitely so is it the patriarchal mm -hmm. kind of with your dad leading or was it both of them where you felt like to say we were a math and science family does that make sense so i feel like uh my dad was a lot more academically inclined like even when he was younger um and then like especially then because like my mom became a stay at home mom versus my dad was like doing physics research. Uh, my dad became e even more. So it w so like, I think my mom does care about math and science. She just hasn't had nearly the experience or amount of time uh, put into it. And did she vocalize too, kind of like this emphasis on math and science as well when you, so maybe not in her schooling, but in her, the way she kind of, curated your home experience about what classes to take or why why your um, dad f was saying what he was saying. Does that make sense? Um, kind of. Like, I think it, it was more of a supporting role. Like, okay. she, she wasn't ever the one saying, like, this is what you should do. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. So as you start noticing that your Utah middle school and high school peers aren't as into math, um, and you're feeling like you don't quite fit in. How does how does your testimony and your relationship with the church evolve mm. from middle school into high school? So, uh, so actually, uh, at the end of middle school, right, I I, I didn't make the countdown round uh, in this math competition. I was really disappointed. So I actually uh, at state or nationals? Uh, nationals. Okay. So so I actually stopped doing math for like six months, um, maybe even. No, I mean, I, I did like school math, but other than that, I didn't really do competition math. Um, and so during that time, like, uh, especially being in the Utah culture, I realized like I wasn't as uh, into Mormonism as many of my peers. So obviously, so, mm -hmm. so my peers would be like the other Orthodox Mormon kids. Um, like, that's, that, that's what I mean. Um, so... So I actually uh, started trying even harder. Uh, I would say I developed religious scrupulosity at this time. Um, so like how, do you, how do you explain that your parents were noticing liberal ward members and, you know, yeah. uh, people associated with BYU who are more progressive or liberal, yet your friends were more into Mormonism than you? 
I would assume that their yeah. parents were progressive or liberal. So, your parents were more orthodox. So yet their kids are more into church than you. How do you? Uh, okay. So I think actually both of my friends though were more ortho had more orthodox parents. Um, they were from like different words. Okay. Um, so you just you just hung around the more orthodox kids. Yeah. Well, because okay. like I just I, I knew to avoid the more liberal, especially like if my parents are talking bad about those kinds of parents and kids, like I'm not going to hang out with them. <laughs> so if a kid has feminist leanings or LGBT sympathies, you're like stay away from them. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, it was a conscious effort. It just was like, yeah. <laughs> Were there other markers like swearing or R-rated movies or no. showing your shoulders? or? So, you so know, I actually, you... I didn't have very many friends uh, until like 11th grade. Okay. Um, so, but uh, other people like I would hang out with. Um, let's see. I, I wouldn't put effort towards hanging out with anyone who wasn't, didn't look devout Mormon. <laughs> Okay. So, mm. okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm kind of hearing a couple things. I'm hearing in the move to Utah, you lost a community uh -huh. and, and had more of an experience of being alone. Mm -hmm. Is that right? In Utah. And then, um, over time, uh, having a form of OCD around, you know, your religion show up. Do you remember what you were feeling during those those years when scrupulosity started manifesting in you? Yeah. So let's see. I think I think part of it was uh, uh, and maybe explain to the audience what you understand scrupulosity means. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So uh, it, uh, it, it, in ninth grade, I wasn't very good at seminary. Uh, it was like I had it like first period of the day because in Utah. You can do that. Uh, but I was, like, very tired. Um, in 10th grade, I started trying to be better. Um, and, like, by 11th grade, uh, I, I was trying to participate all the time in seminary. Um, I, I wasn't actually very comfortable participating, but I, like, I tried. Um, and then I, I was trying to read my scriptures every single day. Uh, I'd get mad at myself if I forgot one day. Um, I would – so <sighs> – uh, I, I felt like the thought police on myself. I, I, I was the thought police on myself. So like uh, th there's some scripture where like Jesus says, even if you even uh, think about mm -hmm. a uh, girl that way. And it's like, so I, so like I, I literally couldn't even think like that girl is cute. Um, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Because I'm like, oh no, that, that that's wrong. Um, and, and just like very... Uh, like I was censoring my own thoughts a bunch of times just because I felt that's what I had to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What types of thoughts were you trying to censor? Um, just like anything sexual. Um, what else? Uh, ooh. Okay. Uh, just like, oh, anger as well. Like if I ever got mad at someone, uh, I didn't want to lash out at them or like say anything potentially hurtful because – uh, I did this once in like third grade and felt guilty for literally years until like I apologized years later for something that happened like literally in third grade. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and like it, it was an accident even to start with. So <laughs> like so that, that kind of like religious scrupulosity where like I, I can't I have to make sure I don't do anything bad uh, or I'll feel, feel guilty for years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so uh, for those who have never heard of scrupulosity, we've covered it a lot of Mormon stories, but it's basically religious obsessive compulsive disorder. And OCD is usually characterized by obsessive thoughts and then some sort of behavioral compulsions that are um, become almost addictive as a way to neutralize the obsessive thoughts. And one last caveat, uh, rumination can be a form of compulsive behavior. In other words, you have these intrusive thoughts come in and then you're constantly ruminating as a way to neutralize the anxiety that the obsessive thoughts, um, you know, elicit. So you could, this could, this could lead to hyper, hyper praying, hyper scripture reading, hyper church attendance, hyper performance, but also hyper guilt, hyper shame, hyper confessing to the bishop. These are all manifestations of religious scrupulosity that's its own diagnosable 
uh, mental illness. It's a very serious thing. Uh, you know, we often think about hand washing with OCD or counting or, um, you know, uh, hoarding or those types of things. But scrupulosity is absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, a form. Yeah. So, so lots of guilt. But like the thing is, I didn't hadn't actually really done like anything bad mm -hmm. ever. Like I wouldn't even say mean things to other people, even if I was angry. Um, but in your mind, you were constantly feeling what? Well, I was constantly feeling guilt for like that one mean comment I said two years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so w how did that translate into how you felt about your Mormon experience or your uh, own worthiness or yeah, so, worth? So I, I didn't feel very worthy. I remember at one bishop interview where like I like like, like I confessed like peeing in the shower. It's like stuff, dumb stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so, you confess to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the bishop said. Yeah, yeah. he's just like whatever. <laughs> like he didn't care. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So and then you said you were trying to get sexual thought, keep sexual thoughts from coming. Yeah. To, how 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 successful were you with that? I, I think I was decently successful. Okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> you could make him go away. I mean, no, not really, but like I would just like yell in my head a bunch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how did this play out in terms of your relationship with the church? Uh, so like I was becoming more devout. I don't know. Uh, what do you mean by like relationship? Like your attendance, your feelings about the church, mm. your obedience to the rules, your commitment to the path that the church had laid okay. out for you. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, in middle school, I didn't really care about church that much. Uh, in high school, I started caring a lot more. I don't think it's super related to the scrupulosity, though. Just like it was more I saw other people who actually cared a lot more about church around me. Um, so like, oh, maybe like if this actually is the true church and like the most important thing, maybe I should actually be caring a little bit more instead of like caring about math and science so much. Um, so, mm. uh, yeah, I don't think uh, my relationship to, to the church, like how I how I thought about the church changed much because of scrupulosity. OK, but uh, yeah. yeah, but it made you. It care less and or invest less in math? Um, made me care a little bit less. Um, I'm like, like, I'll have eternity to figure out math, but I only have this time to work on becoming a better church person. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what'd you do? I, I still did care about math and science a bunch. Yeah. Um, I spent a little bit more time uh, worrying about church stuff, but like, not, hmm, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't too different, though. So um, so in those high school years, uh, did, did you find yourself getting interested in reading the Book of Mormon, reading the Bible, oh. um, learning about, you know, yeah. seminary sure. and the things taught? So, uh, I mean, I... I first read the Book of Mormon when I was like seven. So, okay. Because my parents were like, you have to read this before you get baptized. Oh. Like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. And then the Bible was similar. I read that like when I was young. Cover to uh, cover. Uh, I don't think cover to cover, but I read like a majority of it just when I was young because I was bored during sacrament meeting. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I have a book I can read, I guess. This does happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, wasn't too much there, but, uh, like uh, 11th grade is when I was probably like the most, uh, into the church. Um, this is when like I started trying to take notes during general conference. Cause like, what if there's something super important mm -hmm. I need to write down? Um, what else? Uh, I, I, I don't know. What, what, what else did you ask? Did you start to have plans about what you would do after high school, what career you would pursue, what, parts of the traditional Mormon mm. plan you would sign up yeah. for and follow all that? Yeah. So, so w when it comes to career, I always plan to like be a mathematician. Okay. Uh, computer science isn't too different. Um, when it comes to like after high school. So, uh, in my family, it was just like the default that, uh, men go on missions right when they turn 18 or as soon as possible. So I'd had cousins already go. Uh, my older brother left on a mission 
right after high school. So mm-hmm. that was just like the default plan. I didn't have to think about it. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And as you're, so I'm, I'm assuming you're taking biology, honors biology classes or AP biology classes, uh, um, AP history class. Are you doing all the AP classes, AP chemistry, kind et cetera? Of, so, so actually, uh, uh, starting in 10th grade, I started taking classes at BYU uh, but half the time. So, so actually taking BYU classes. Yeah, for like math, uh, computer science, uh, also like one or two science classes. So so for those who have watched enough Mormon stories or who have studied many of the hard sciences, they'll know pretty quickly that whether it's archaeology, anthropology, genetics, you know, you could even say physics, linguistics. There are all sorts of sciences that start to really challenge Bible stories, Book of Mormon stories, Mormon oh, doctrine yeah. and theology. Up through, let's just say, 11th grade, as you're really getting into STEM more and more, did any questions start popping out about things like 6,000-year Earth, yeah, Adam and absolutely. Eve, global flood, Noah's Ark, DNA in the Book of Mormon, and talk about all of those things. That- yeah, yeah. So uh, DNA in the Book of Mormon actually didn't really pop up. I, I don't know why. I just never really saw it thought about it. Uh, but like, yeah, Noah's flood, uh, and 6,000 year earth was very confusing to me. I'm like, how does this work? Uh, my dad had the opinion. It was just like a local flood. Um, but it like states very clearly it covered the whole earth. Um, uh, and like the 6,000 year earth was like a big thing and evolution, obviously like cannot, they, they, they don't really work out. Um, so I, I remember like, in 11th grade, I started thinking, well, maybe, like, the earth really is 6,000 years old. Because if the church is true, uh, it, it's very clear from the scriptures that this is how it has to work out. Uh, so I, I, I never entertained it too seriously, but I did start having those leanings. Uh, and that that's, like, very worrying looking back. Very what? Very worrying looking back. Worrying? Uh, oh, worrying. Yeah. Why do you say worrying? Uh, because, like— uh, what what other conspiracy theories could I like? Th- th- that's how you like fall into conspiracy theories. Like you start rejecting uh, evidence because you know something is true to start with. Hmm. Um, and and you know what? Highly intelligent people can be mm-hmm. believers in conspiracy theories, right? Yeah, I, like uh, my mom is very into conspiracy theories, and I think it's because uh, like the church has trained her in that way. To like, well, you come to conclusion first, and then try to find evidence to support it. Mm. Hmm. And so as, as your mind starts considering, we'll just say conspiracy theories like 6,000 year earth evolution's yeah. bad. How do you, how do you deal with that fork in the road? Yeah. So actually, uh, one of my friends asked me like, James, you don't believe in evolution. Sorry. You, you believe, you, you, sorry, you, you believe in evolution, right? Uh, and I'm like, well, maybe not. But then, like, I had a serious think, like, wait, actually, no, that is completely stupid, James. Of course evolution is real. So, mm. <laughs> and luckily that happened just, like, a couple weeks after I started questioning evolution. So, <laughs> I, I don't even, even remember how we got onto that topic, but I'm glad that happened. <laughs> and maybe you've already said this, but how did you, where did your parents come down on evolution? Uh, I'm pretty sure my dad and mom are both agree with evolution. <laughs> agree with it. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting then, r- right there, it's tough, I would guess, to be an Orthodox Mormon and believe in organic evolution because immediately that means a billions of years old Earth. Exactly. And it means Adam and Eve weren't the first humans, which means a ton of the Mormon plan of salvation mm-hmm. and scripture immediately can no longer be taken literally, which takes you away from orthodoxy. Yeah, I- I- exactly. So, like, this is why I started questioning evolution. I'm like, for th- for those exact reasons. Uh, I-, I don't know exactly the uh, h- how my parents resolved this. Um, you didn't talk to them about it. N- no, no, no. I-, I did a little. So my dad uh, said something about how uh, maybe God guided evolution to help create humans. And uh, maybe Adam and Eve were like the first humans, but like, sorry, weren't the first uh, humanoids, but like the first humans with souls, um, something like that. Uh, the idea that God used evolution to get 
organisms to the point yeah. of being able to be receptacles of divine spirits. Yeah. And then at some designated point, Adam and Eve were the first humanoids that God could send actual human spirits into versus non-human spirits yeah. before. So, and like, something like that, which <laughs> I, I don't really understand because like the Neanderthals existed for thousands, millions of years. No, not millions. Sorry. Hundreds, Hundreds of thousands of, thousands of yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. Like alongside humans. So. so it would also be like a, a very fast paced evolution. If God's hand is in it, it'd be like the... F- Whatever. I mean, a thousand year version of actually what would normally no. take millions of years. Is mm, that the idea? Maybe like of the billion year version of what could have taken trillions of years <laughs> kind uh-huh. of deal. Okay. Okay. So you're starting to, you, your parents are giving you their explanation. They're giving you the freedom of believing in evolution, but still believing in Mormon doctrine and theology. Uh-huh. They're giving you, ex, ex, you know, sort of outs like. Yeah. Regional flood. Yeah. I would also uh, uh, look up Fair Mormon a lot. And then also, ooh, I don't remember. There's this one website, uh, something like where they answer questions, but it's not Fair Mormon. Do you mm-hmm. know what this one is? I mean, there's Book of, there's Book of Mormon Central. It's there's Book of that. Abraham Central. It's not that one. There's Mormoner. Um, uh, uh, I, I can't remember what it is. Yeah. There's, but, there's a lot of these out there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, anytime I had a question that I couldn't resolve through the Bible dictionary, um, <laughs> I would look it up on one of these websites. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Thinking of a junior, a high school junior, already starting to question the church's truth claims and, and looking up Fair Mormon answers. One this, of the problems this with sophomore year. Sophomore yeah. year. Yeah. Because one of the problems with Fair Mormon website is you go up there to ask one question or two, but they've got a thousand questions listed, mm-hmm. so it can introduce more questions. I don't oh, know. yeah. So I, I didn't actually like Fair Mormon very much because I think I, I saw these questions like, huh, this looks a little anti. Uh, it was this other other site. But I don't remember what it's called. Okay. Uh, it was much more orthodox also. They're the ones who are like, yeah, evolution – it says in scriptures, like evolution is not a thing. <laughs> or Ju- the 6,000 years old. <laughs> Julia says, ask Gramps. There's yes. a website. Is that, that it? That's it. Julia, <laughs> Julia nailed it. I remember <laughs> ask Gramps. He was, he was an early internet participant, kind of pre, kind of pre fair almost. Yeah. yeah that's funny. <laughs> nice job, Julia. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So where does that take your, your, your orthopraxy and your orthodoxy in the church? Yeah, so uh, orthopraxy, I was probably like, I I was the guy uh, in our youth group who knew all the answers. uh, Okay. Because, like, I I thought about them a lot. Um, What else? Were you ever tempted to sin? No. In any of the Mormon? No, the guilt would be way too much if I, like, actually sinned. (laughs) (laughs) So you would just ruminate about sinning but not actually sin? Like, not even ruminate. I would try, try my best to not. Even yeah. think about sinning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so where did your Mormon yeah. story go from there? Yeah. So I, I ended up being like second counselor in the priest quorum. Um, uh, I, I tried to organize things a little better once I became in that leadership position. Uh, but I kind of gave up because it turns out like most of the priests didn't really care about church. Um which I, I was so confused about. Like, you go to church every week. Why don't you care to come to activities? Or, like, why, why are you on your phone during priesthood quorum? Uh, you so, cared a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. And it bugged you that other kids didn't seem to care as much. It did bug me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And as your... Um, so it sounds like your sophomore, junior, senior year were less about national math competitions. Yeah, kind of like uh, I, I I learned like just hmm, I, I was far too competitive in middle school. Like I, I was throwing up before some competitions because it was just like mm-hmm. way too stressful. So uh, so in ninth grade, like I didn't do competition math in 10th. Uh, I actually started doing some chemistry uh, that was an interesting time. Why? <laughs> what? Why? Why? Because, like, chemistry. <laughs> like it's lower math? Yeah. Well, A lo- lower science? It, it's more wishy-washy. <laughs> chemistry is? Okay, because like, it, t- 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 <laughs> to be, like, not wishy-washy, you have to actually, like, know quantum mechanics, and I didn't. So 
So, like, in 10th grade, I took organic chemistry at BYU. <laughs> um, That's a class that, like, pre-med students fail, right? Yeah, I actually didn't do that great. I, I think I got a B. <laughs> okay. But you're also a junior in high but school, th right? The reason I got a B is because I'm like, dude, this isn't rigorous. Like, you have these, <laughs> these equations, but it's just, like, you have to know what – you can't derive them from anything. <laughs> so you were just turned off by the lack of rigor in organic chemistry. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't want to have to memorize 50 equations. I just want to, like – know how it works on a fundamental level and just like apply that. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you can't actually do that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So anyways, so ninth <laughs> and 10th grades, I like kind of did chemistry. I also got into computer science a little more than I, I, I'd already been programming for like a really long time. Like but, Java or what? Uh, I, I mean, I know a bunch of languages, but like Python, especially. Um, so I started doing like uh, USA computing Olympiad, a couple other computer competitions. Um, so, but, but yeah, so it, it was, it was nice to have a break from, uh, from the math competitions, uh, in 11th grade, uh, I started doing math competitions, competitions again, uh, actually 10th grade, end of 10th grade, middle of 10th grade. I don't know. Uh, so there's like a competition BYU hosts every year. Uh, I did that. Uh, what's it called? Intermountain math contest. Okay. Um, so that. So once I started doing these like college contests, it got actually a lot more fun because uh, I'd reached a point in math competitions where it wasn't proof based. It was just like you have to know the formulas and it, it became a grind instead of like elegant. Um, but once I got to the competition, college competitions, uh, they were all proof based. So th there are proof based math ones, uh, sorry, high school ones. But uh how the system works is you have to go through a couple levels that are not proof based and are very grindy. Uh, and I was never willing to like put in the work to get through those. Um, but anyways, uh, so once I started doing college competitions, I started enjoying the competition math again. Um, that was fun. And I also was learning a lot more math because it's like the college competitions can do are literally like any math out there. So watching, uh, Watching Oppenheimer, there were all these, you know, it mentions Einstein, it mentions mm -hmm. Bohr, it mentions Heisenberg. Uh, did you have math or physics heroes? You know, there's Stephen Hawking. <laughs> did you have math or physics heroes growing up? Uh, not really. Like, um, I kind of liked Vermont a little, but I, yeah, not not really heroes. No heroes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're starting to enjoy college level math competitions yeah. in high school. Yep. And that's rejuvenating your love and interest in math. Yeah. Okay. Then where did things go? Um, like in terms of math? Anything. I sure. mean, okay. We're, so bu we're building, we're building to sure. a big decision. Yes. You're right. So okay. Yeah. So what, where so, are we building to? So, uh, m the first college competition I did, Intermountain Math Contest, I, I think. I won that one. I'm oh. not certain about this, uh, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I did. Uh, I'm like, wow, I actually know all of this stuff. Uh, I'm like, I, I was a little surprised. Um, and then in 11th grade, uh, I did this thing. Uh, BYU has this Putnam seminar. So the Putnam competition is a national competition. Um, and so every week I go to the Putnam seminar, uh, learn some more competition math stuff, college level stuff. Um, and we had pizza every week, so that's mostly why I went. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, that year was when COVID hit. Uh, so, and because I was taking some classes at BYU, uh, this meant I was eligible to take the Putnam. Uh, I previously hadn't wanted to take the Putnam, though, because uh, you can only have four years of eligibility. So I'm like, I will just use those when I'm an undergrad. But because COVID hit... Uh, they waived the eligibility thing. They're like, this doesn't count as a year. Uh, so I ended up taking the Putnam in 11th grade and I got like top 100 in the nation. Whoa. So yeah, I was like really happy about this. Um, and I got like the top score in, from BYU, but like. <laughs> so you're, you're competing with other actual BYU students. BYU, like, and students As a across, junior in high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just college students across the nation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I got a really good score on this. Uh, and I, I'm still really happy about that. Uh, I have to ask you if you've ever seen the movie Goodwill Hunting and if um, you ever identified with the Matt Damon character in Goodwill Hunting. I have never seen the movie. I have heard a little bit about it. 
You haven't um, seen Good Will Hunting? No. <laughs> it's basically about this kid who's from from like South Boston uh, who yeah, like yeah, never I, got to go to college, but he was better than everyone in math. Yeah. So I, I, I've heard a little about it like that. But it's RC. So you've never seen it. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I watched a couple R movies, but, like, I don't know. I'm, I don't care too much about watching movies. Okay. Um, right. Well, it's just, a, I guess I was going to ask, what's it like to be maybe what some would call a young math prodigy, mm. do, oh, performing better than people multiple years older than you, who are yeah. also probably considered prodigies okay. from their peers, right? Yeah. So, uh it was a little weird because I was like taking these BYU classes, but like I was always the youngest person. I remember one of my professors is like, uh, are you married? But like, it was hard to understand him. This was over Zoom. So I'm like, I, I said, yes. And he's like, oh, do you have any kids? I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm not married. I'm only 16. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was weird having all the students be older than me because like I, I never really became friends with them. Uh, but then like the people my own age, it was hard to become friends with because mm -hmm. I was just like, not in very many classes with them. Um, so it felt, did it feel lonely, a little isolating? Yeah, it was a little lonely that way. Um, I ended up like doing cross country and track and I ended up finding friends there. What high school? Uh, Tim Few. Okay. So. See uh, the shirt. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> As the shirt. It says Tim Few cross country. Uh -huh. Yes, it does. Okay. So that was a little weird. Um, in terms of like, other stuff. It was kind of nice because I had lots of opportunities. Uh, like there's lots of professors at BYU who just like knew my name uh, and would love to talk to me. Like I remember in ninth grade, I got to talk to uh, Dr. Lawler uh, and he just was like showing me some linear algebra and complex analysis stuff. And like, oh, I don't know complex analysis. What do you mean uh, integral around the pole, whatever. But <laughs> it, yeah, it was like good in that way. Um, is he an important math professor no. at BYU? Uh, well, maybe at BYU. Uh, he, he wasn't like important in my life. Just like, okay. yeah, that was like one experience. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that, that, that was nice. Um, also I think I had like several professors who wanted to do research with me, but I just never really had the time for that. So but, okay. yeah, I had lots of opportunities. Yeah. So that was good. Okay. So that sounds great in terms of your development mm -hmm. as uh, someone who loves math. It sounds like you're about to have a very promising set of opportunities for math. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 12th grade rolls around. Okay. Um, I'm still very, very, uh, wait. oh yeah, very, very scrupulous. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm basically thinking like I'll just apply to BYU and that's like really it. Um, so I spend like... I don't know, 10, 20 hours working on my BYU essays. I, I don't even know why, because, like, I was an easy admit to BYU. Is, um, it, is it pretty safe to say that if you're winning college competitions in math, that, like, a 1600 on the SAT is pretty much a given? Yeah, yeah, I got a 36 on all the sections. On, on the, the ACT, you got yeah, a 36. Yeah. On the SAT, you would have gotten um, So I took the SAT in, in like, ninth grade. I, I didn't do very great. Uh, <laughs> on the math part? No, no, I... Obviously, I got 800 on the math. Okay. <laughs> Obviously. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Like, SAT math is way easier than even math counts. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay, so perfect scores on, on the math stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> so BYU would have been a shoe-in. Yeah, yeah. B BYU was a shoe-in, but I spent a lot of time. So I wanted to get the uh, presidential scholarship at BYU, but I didn't understand, actually, that they had two separate uh, applications. First, you have your admissions application, and then you have a scholarship application. So I did the admissions application. I spent like 20 hours on it. Uh, scholarship application rolls around and I'm like, oh, well, I guess they can just read all the stuff I wrote in my admissions essay. And then like I wrote a couple other things. I don't think they actually do read the admissions essay though, mm. because I ended up not getting the presidential scholarship. Um, mm. So like my older brother had gotten it. Uh, I had had extended family aunts and uncles get it. So I was a little surprised, um, but like, okay. yeah, but it's probably because like I spent so much time on the admissions, but not much on that one. Yeah. So basically my plan was only, I'm only going to go to BYU. Um, that's literally like my plan since I was seven. 
uh, but then I'm like, you know, uh, I did, I learned some math from MIT OpenCourseWare. I also did uh, Battle Code, which is a coding competition. Uh, so I did that like since eighth grade. I'm like, huh? So MIT is like kind of a cool school. They do some cool stuff. Maybe I, I'll just apply to this on a whim. Isn't that the top math school in the country, basically? Or yeah, yeah. But like, they would don't anything have many, compare? Caltech? But, but like, there's not very many Mormons at MIT. Like, how am I going to get married? <laughs> when I go to MIT. Yeah. So, so this is why I never really seriously considered other schools because I'm like, I, I need to be able to find a wife, uh, and to do that, I need to go to BYU because you know, like, marriage is super important. Yeah. Um, and even though like. Uh, like, I wasn't able to date in high school because my parents are like, no, you can't actually have a girlfriend. That's against church rules. Uh, like, still, for some reason, I thought a lot about uh, what my dating life would look like in college. And the only place I could have one would be BYU. So. Mm. Okay. So. Um, so, but I, I decided to apply to MIT on a whim, like. Uh, even like maybe if I get in, I can like just put that on the, like, my scholarship application for BYU and it'll make them want to give me a better scholarship. Mm -hmm. So that'll go to BYU kind of deal. And uh, is MIT the top math yeah, yeah. university in the country? It's the, so, hmm. so it has the top mathematicians. If you look at Putnam scores, uh, usually I think it was like 70 of the top 100 this past year for, from MIT. So, mm, okay. uh, in terms of the math department, I think Harvard might have, like, the professors might be a little better. But uh, mm -hmm. MIT does have the best students okay. by a lot. Yeah, okay. It's a place to go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, anyways, I applied to MIT kind of on a whim. I have one of my essays is, like, all about Mormonism, how uh, I'm trying to be, like, Jesus, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> yeah, I spent like, I don't know, a couple hours on this application. I didn't even like, uh, I, I think I read through it like once just to make sure it wasn't awful. <laughs> but like, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine an MIT sort of like admissions counselor reviewing <laughs> an essay that's basically saying I'm trying to be like Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was more like about how like I want to serve people and I love teaching people math, um, <laughs> stuff like that. Like a gospel and gospel oriented approach to math, basically. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was, looking back, like I, I feel a little bad for that admissions yeah. officer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but like I did have like the ac academics, thirty six ACT. Uh, I did lots of math competitions and CS competitions, so uh, I did end up getting into MIT, hmm. and I was like. I actually, I didn't care at all. <laughs> really? I woke up like that Saturday, kind of s slept in a little and like, ugh, got out of bed. Like, I don't know, 1 p.m., kind of still foggy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I got into, like looked it up on my laptop. Okay, cool. I got in, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> a couple hours later, texted my parents. Oh yeah, got into MIT. <laughs> but like, I didn't, I didn't care. <laughs> um, did they, I was going did to, they want you to go what? to MIT? Did they want you to go to MIT, your parents? Uh, so that, so my dad was like super happy. He's like, wow, that, that, that's, that's great. Um, I think I was actually a little surprised about this. They, they took us out to dinner. They're like, for congratulations. And I was a little surprised cause <laughs> like when I was doing math competitions, uh, I felt like I had done much more and gotten much less praise. Um, hmm. so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and also like, I didn't care about it. So I'm like. Does it really mm. matter to celebrate? Mm. So, and your brother applied as well. So yeah, my twin brother applied as well. He also got in. Okay. Um, so actually, in like my interview, I'm like, if I get in, he should also get in because he's also awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, hopefully, mm. uh, no, that probably didn't actually matter. Anyways, so so we got in. Uh, what my parents thought about it. So my dad, uh, my dad was kind of even. He's like, it doesn't really matter where you go to your life. MIT would be good. I think he. He said uh, BYU would be a little better. I didn't quite understand why. Um, so I think he thought MIT, sorry, MIT Mormons were like a little nerdy and a little weird, um, which I agree about. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know that. Uh, he just like was like, you shouldn't go to MIT. There's a be bigger, better community at BYU. Hmm. Um, my mom was very against me going to MIT. So... Hmm. And I didn't understand this either uh, for a while. So uh, eventually, uh, 
we went to lunch with some BYU math professors because they're like trying to recruit us uh, with my parents. Um, and they're like, okay, we're going to give you a scholarship on top of whatever BYU gives you if you come to MIT and compete in the Putnam for BYU. Uh, so very, very appealing. Um, at this time, I think I was leaning towards MIT. Uh, but like basically the entire lunch time, uh, my mom was saying, James, you should not go to MIT. You should go to BYU. Uh, and actually one of the BYU professors was like, you should go to MIT. Uh, cause he went to MIT, uh, and did well and he liked it, I guess. Um, and then there's also another BYU professor. Sorry, the other professor was saying, no, you should absolutely go to BYU. So it was very interesting dynamic, um, kind of split on, mm -hmm. but there, there, there's, everyone was split on where I should go. Um, so I actually, because one of the professors was saying like, I should go to MIT, I started defending BYU. Like, no, but like BYU has, uh, whatever BYU has, <laughs> um, Anyways, after the dinner, uh, we're driving, sorry, lunch, we're driving back. Uh, and I'm like, why, why is my mom so against MIT? Uh, and I learn, like my, my dad tells me uh, that uh, one of the professors, so the, the one who was very for BYU, uh, his son went to MIT and later left the Mormon church. Uh, and also my mom had actually gone to prom with this guy's son. So, like, they both had personal experiences with people going to MIT and then falling away from the church. So, hmm. like, that's why they were so against it. Uh, my mom didn't want me to do that. Um, so, th th that's why I learned. Um, then there's, like, campus preview weekend at MIT. Uh, and this is where uh, I, I actually met all the BYU, sorry, all the Mormons at MIT uh, for their FHE night. And I'm like, okay, now I get why uh, my dad was against MIT because they were pretty weird. Like, like s some of them were liberal, but that's not what I mean. Uh, like, just like far more nerdy than even the average MIT student. Mm, whoa. Yeah. How do you explain that? Uh, so, so, so my opinion is like, it's the only way they can still be Mormon at MIT because like they have to, uh, what's it called? Compartmentalize Mormonism and then the rest of their life. Uh, mm. and so, yeah. That so that sense. drives them to be extra isolated, yeah. extra nerdy so that they don't get tainted by the world, the worldliness yeah. of a secular university. Yeah. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. So they out nerd the nerds, Mormon, <laughs> MIT nerds out nerd yeah. the nerds. I, I was a little surprised. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so when I got back, like I was telling my dad this and he's like, yeah, this is why I, I said you shouldn't go to MIT. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I have this choice like MIT versus BYU and then another choice to make. Do I go directly on a mission? Uh, which is the expected thing to do. But I was also considering not going straight on a mission. Um, going to college for a couple of years because uh, I thought I could graduate from MIT a year, maybe even two years early because I'd taken a bunch of classes at BYU already. Um, so like, wouldn't it make more sense to just do that? That way I don't have to like relearn a bunch of math or take time off. For good stuff. Yeah. So so these were my, my questions. Uh, also, uh, at this time, like I was wondering if a mission was even useful or good because um, I'd been getting uh, emails from all the uh, missionaries from a year older than me who'd left, uh, all my friends, and like most of them were, most of them were like, we couldn't find anyone to teach this week uh, when they did teach. Uh, this is kind of depressing, uh, d just those kinds of vibes. And I, I, I'm told that Mormon missionaries aren't even supposed to like say they're having a bad time, but like it still comes across in the emails. And like, huh? So they're not finding anyone to teach the gospel, which is like kind of the whole point of a mission. Uh, they're not having a good time. They're not learning. Uh, and then like I learned stuff about how missions weren't really required. Um, it was a big shock when I learned like that Russell M. Nelson, uh, Dallin H. Oaks and like the top three hadn't gone on missions, uh, before college or Oaks, like during Irene college. Yeah. And Nelson, none of the three went on missions. Th that was a big shock. Yeah. So. But anyway, so I, I'm taking mission prep. Uh, this is second semester, senior year. 
Uh, I'm taking mission prep at BYU. Uh, because I, I'm still planning on going to mission because this is what everyone expects me to do. This is what I have expected myself to do since I was literally like in primary thinking I want to go on and be a missionary now. Um, but I, I'm just looking at this. And I'm like, is the mission actually the right thing to do? Uh, it's going to delay like marriage by several years. It's going to delay my education. All these other things that the church says is good. And like, I, I, I know Russell of Nelson is saying you have to go on a mission and like, but do you actually have to? Like he didn't. Um, <laughs> he did okay. Yeah. He did pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And he, like he's literally <laughs> the prophet. So, so uh, very much questioning this. So I actually go to my parents and I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to serve a mission. Um, I, I, I feel like I would be doing better things with my life if I even just go to college. Uh, so at this time, I was uh, coaching math counts at Centennial Middle School. Uh, it was just once a week, but I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, huh, the people I'm teaching math, i uh, sorry, the math I'm teaching right now is probably having a bigger effect on people's lives than if I were to serve a mission, like even just once a week. Uh, and so this is why I'm like, I, so, so I was seriously questioning this. Um, so, so I went, uh, I, I asked, I told my parents this um, and like my, my mom got pretty, uh, I don't know the right word for it. Uh, not disappointed, like not angry, but just like, hmm. Let's see. So, so, so my dad seemed, I, I, I don't know what he thought. Uh, he was much calmer. Uh, my mom was like, James, you have to go on a mission, blah, 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 stuff like that. Um, like, uh, yeah, anyways, so that, so there's that, uh, gained lots of pressure from my mom. Uh, I, I think I also got lots of pressure from my dad, but uh, he was more like, we will, I will still accept you even if you don't go on a mission. <laughs> <laughs> but in like a, you wouldn't be as worthy kind of way. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. I think he secretly thought I had been sinning or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Did their reaction surprise you? Um, no, not at all. <laughs> so... Anyways, uh, this is like January. Um, I'd been filling out my mission papers, but I never finished them. Uh, partly just because I was procrastinating. Partly because I wasn't sure I wanted to finish them. I was taking mission prep. Um, mission prep was very weird. Uh, like, uh, the professor was a little creepy. Uh, as in, like, his smile felt so fake. Uh, and he just constantly had it on, but like, yeah. And, and when he talked about stuff, I, I remember like one time, uh, we were talking about like, I think it's Alma 31, uh, how Alma, so, so how Korhor is coming and saying like, uh, uh, there is no God. And then Alma turns around and he's like, well, everything denotes there is God. Just look around you. And then, uh, and at this time, like I, I knew that wasn't a good argument, um, <laughs> because like no, it doesn't. Um, but my professor is like, uh, see, look, there's a logical fallacy here. I'm like, oh, he's gonna point out Alma's logical fallacy because like that's the logical fallacy. I'm like, no, he said Korhor's the one with the the fallacy, and I was shocked. I'm like, whoa, you're so close. <laughs> like, how, how, so. Uh, we, we were required to read like, I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes uh, from like these specific chapters every single day. So I'd read through them a bunch. And like two chapters later, Alma actually fixes this fallacy with like a, a different thing. So I thought that's the way he was going. But no, 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 no. He talks about how Korhor is the one with the fallacy because can't you just look around you? Everything denotes there is a god. So uh, that, uh, all the salesmen, it, it felt very like uh, we were being taught to be salesmen in this mission prep class. Um like, for example, mm -hmm. uh, after you should always extend an invitation to or a commitment after every single discussion, like, will you pray about this? Will you come to church? Whatever. And it's like that, 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 that that's very salesman-y, not uh, sharing the gospel. So I, I was getting very turned off from a mission, but I felt a bunch of pressure to go. So that's where I'm at. Uh, these are the decisions. Mission, MIT, BYU, uh, Actually, there's also the third, fourth, like no college at all because I don't know. College is a little useless. Um, <laughs> you could become like like Bill Gates didn't finish college. Like yeah, Steve Jobs didn't 
Yeah. Finish college. In like, is, that, I, is that the idea? Uh, no, I actually wasn't thinking of startups, but uh, I, I had the skills. Like, I was already a top 1% programmer, so, like, I could find a job if I needed to. So Amazon or yeah. Microsoft or somewhere, Facebook, Meta, whatever. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the after you um, kind of told your parents that you were thinking of... Um, not going on a mission, or that a mission might not be the best use of your time, yeah. right? Do you remember after their responses, um, did it affect you? Like, did it affect the way you were feeling at the time in any way? Or do you feel like after you met with your parents and your mom had kind of that strong reaction of like, go, uh, no, 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 go. So and you're, did it, or were you just neutral? Mm. You felt the same way. I didn't feel too much different. I did feel a little uh, extorted because I hadn't wanted to tell them that. Uh, I just kind of wanted to keep it private, think about it more on my own. Uh, but, like, they kind of pushed oh. for, like, what are you thinking about? Um, yeah. So, like, yeah. Okay, so when you actually told them it wasn't it wasn't your intention going into it that you were going to yeah. tell them. I was That's just, something that was brought out yeah. in the conversation. I was just talking to them, a little tired. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. But mm -hmm. with regard to your feeling about how it might not be the best use of time, their reactions didn't really affect, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it didn't. Your feeling or thought about. Yeah. Okay. Like, like all, all they could really say was, uh, you have to be a return missionary to be, like, a good Mormon or whatever. And it's like, huh? Yeah. But, like, th that's also what I felt for a very long time, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like at this point the the questions about BYU slash mission slash MIT slash college were kind of like wedges into you questioning what you had been taught, the social assumptions, the religious assumptions, what you had been taught your whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was kind of forcing it to all come to a head, mm -hmm. maybe? Yeah, it, it, it was. I'm like, I have to figure this stuff out. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, my, my questioning of authority started a little earlier. Um, so like, uh, basically, I, I noticed that I would not ever hang out with a female friend one on one because my parents are like that that's basically dating um, <laughs> and like you can't you have to go on group dates only so, so uh, I, this happened this was like in the beginning of 12th grade I noticed this I'm like huh so but that's not what Jesus would do uh, so I, I stopped following that uh, rule uh, which it, it definitely felt like a rule uh, so that's when I w would say I started questioning uh, all, like, the rules and what my duty and right thing to do is and, like, tr try to figure out what actually is the right thing to do. Hmm. And how would you talk about, did that make your, did you have any kickback scrupulosity-wise? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. I'm like, no, this is absolutely the right thing to do. <laughs> so you, at some point, were able to shake off kind of the Mormon, Orthodox Mormon voice in your head? Yeah. That was causing you to doubt yourself. To, yeah. And like to listen to what other people say is the right thing. Yeah. That's, that's a that's really, that's a developmental step. Many 40 yeah. or 50 year olds have a hard time yeah. making. Yeah. Even after they've lost all faith in the church. So, I mean, that's. Yeah. Significant. That's significant that you were starting to feel that way. It's what, yeah. 17? Uh, let's see. Yeah, it was 17. Mm -hmm. Uh and so one of my friends, like, this was, like, especially edgy. Uh, she was actually ex-Mormon. Hmm. So I, I would hang out with her one-on-one, -on -one, uh, just talk about different stuff. I, I think uh, she didn't want to talk about the church because, like, we, we'd been friends earlier, but I'd gotten kind of mad at her because she'd brought up uh, some ex-Mormon stuff. Actually, it wasn't because of that. It's because she... Yeah, it was for a little different reason, but it was related to that. So she didn't really talk about the church, which I'm, I was glad about. But eventually, like as we talked more, she did start bringing up some stuff. So uh, it, it was very, it, it was good to hear another perspective, uh, other than like ask Gramps mm -hmm. about like, because <laughs> like I had lots of questions before, but I'd always been able to find an explanation. 
maybe it wasn't the best explanation, but mm -hmm. an explanation. But like to have someone who came to a different conclusion uh, able to talk to about talk with these things out with was mm -hmm. good. Well, good from your point of view, maybe not good from your mom's point of view. I mean, they didn't even know about this because <laughs> I knew they would not uh, not like me talking. They wouldn't even like me hanging out with girls one-on-one, -on -one, let alone talking to an ex-Mormon. <laughs> yeah. So you had to kind of hide that part of your life. Yeah. 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 But you felt good about it because you felt like you were seeking yeah. truth or what? Like, like, uh, like this girl had lost almost all of her friends when she turned ex-Mormon. Hmm. So, like, I, I wanted to be a good friend. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't ma It didn't matter that she's a girl or she's ex-Mormon. <laughs> yeah. And I guess like, back to your point about Jesus, that Jesus mm -hmm. would have probably supported befriending yeah. someone who is rejected, a social outcast, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're trying to follow Jesus yep. the best way you knew how? Yeah. Okay. So where'd that lead? I'm so, dying to know. So where did that lead? So actually, uh, we almost started dating. Uh, this was like months later. Uh, <laughs> we almost started dating. Uh, I'm like, okay, before we decide on actually becoming boyfriend, girlfriend, I need to make sure my parents would be okay with that because this would be a very much public thing, decision. Um, so I went home, talked to my parents, and they were like, absolutely, no, you cannot get a girlfriend. They were like, I'm just so curious. Before How you would you feel about this scenario? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before you go on a mission, absolutely, no, you can't have any distractions on a mission. At this time, I'm, I'm even questioning, like, <laughs> do I even want to go on a mission? Um, I think this was before uh, I was... I told my parents, though, I was questioning about the mission. So oh. so I think, like, when I actually did tell them, they just, like, assumed maybe I did some naughty stuff. <laughs> mm. so, so for the never Mormons, fill in the dots about why a, a Mormon parents would not want you dating a, a young uh, woman before your mission. Yeah. So uh, I think for my parents, they just assumed I wouldn't actually, like, do anything bad because I was a very responsible kid. But, like, they didn't want me to have any distractions on my mission. Uh, but... Uh, other reasons, uh, parents, I, I think, uh, okay, so it's also like in the first, it was in the first strength of youth. It, it's been removed since, but it was in the first strength of youth when I was in 12th grade. That, this is like, a pamphlet for you should youth. Not, yeah. That you that, should not. That you should not have a boyfriend, girlfriend in, uh, until like you're ready to get, be getting married, which would be after a mission. Yeah. Um, and so also there's the I think passage we, about arousing yeah. the passions. Do you, do you remember that? Yeah. I, I don't think that was too much. Of a worry for my parents. They weren't worried you'd have sex or had sexual experiences before. Yeah, I don't mission. think they're too worried about that. Okay. Maybe maybe my mom a little actually, uh, but uh, not my dad. Okay. Um, but I, I think that was also yeah part of it. Like they want to make sure I'm not making out with girls, whatever. But yeah. like you don't need a girlfriend to make out with girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know. This what, is true. <laughs> don't know what they're thinking there. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, yeah. Uh, so, like, for example, my parents uh, didn't kiss until they were engaged. Mm. Um, I had a friend back in New Mexico whose parents didn't kiss until they were married. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, they they probably didn't want anything like that to happen. Okay. Anything risque. <laughs> so what happened next? So, so, so what happened next? I basically called her up the next day and like, yeah, that... We, we can't date like my parent. My, my dad literally said he would try to break us up every single day that we date until we are bro broken up. Uh, so like that can't happen. Mm -hmm. obviously, obviously she was uh, like upset about that. Um, <laughs> she later got a boyfriend though, like not too long after. So not so bad for her, but yeah. I was very disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened next? So, uh, so what happened next? Um, this is like, this was like, uh, my biggest challenge to authority yet. Um, I, I'd been talking to her about lots of different stuff. Uh, and let's see. So I, I decided I really needed to figure out if I'm going to BYU, MIT, Mission, whatever. Uh, this is a couple weeks after that incident. Um, so I, I decided I need to get my patriarchal blessing that will tell me what to do with my life. <laughs> So I, I, I go set that all up. I, I get my patriarchal, patriarchal blessing and ex 
am extremely disappointed. It's like, doesn't tell me anything. In fact, it's a little insulting. It's like, some, some of it's like, you need to make sure uh, you give a full day's labor when you work, whatever. I'm like, dude, why would I ever not be, not do that? Uh, so I, I, I'm a little insulted and disappointed. I'm like, there's nothing in there. Sometimes the patriarch will like interview you beforehand, ask yeah. you what dilemmas or issues you're facing. I could imagine a scenario where you're like, well, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to go on a mission or okay. go to MIT or go to college at all. Yeah. And then magically that might potentially influence what the so, patriarch, patriarch blesses you with in your patriarchal yeah. blessing. So, so I, I thought this might happen. Uh, so I avoided uh, answering any questions like, oh. with any details. You didn't want to poison, like, poison the well. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, actually, the well was already poisoned because my twin brother had gotten his patriarchal blessing from the same patriarch a yeah. week before. Oh. And they talked... My, my mom talked with him a bunch, like, afterwards. So the well was already poisoned. I didn't know this, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, or didn't think about it. <laughs> John, do you want to explain what a patriarchal blessing is? Or do you feel like that's kind of known? I mean, for never Mormons, it's basically this super old man gives you a blessing that's supposed to be God's roadmap for the rest of your life. Yeah. Where they'll say, you will serve a mission. You will get married in the temple. You will have a, a career where you'll influence millions of people and bring them to the gospel. You'll raise righteous children in Zion. And in the end, when you die, you'll raise up in the morning of the first resurrection to meet Jesus Christ and to become a God. Yeah. And you're declared your lineage, your, yeah. your blood lineage tied to the tribes of Israel. Of course, like at the very end, they're like, this, these blessings are only hold if you actually stay true to the faith. They're <laughs> contingent on your faithfulness, which yeah. means if anything doesn't come true, it's, it's what we call blame reversal. It's always your fault yeah. if something doesn't come true. Okay. So anyways, uh, I get my patriarchal, patriarchal blessing. Around the same time, I've been emailing a missionary friend, like asking for advice. What would you do? Uh, or what should I do, actually? Um, uh, and he's like, James, you should go on a mission. Like, that, that that's the best decision. That's the decision I made. Uh, but he also mentioned a couple other things, like that right before he left on a mission, he had seriously doubted uh, the Church of uh, uh, Mormonism. Uh, like, even when he was in the MTC, he was very much doubting. Like, huh, that's very interesting because this was, like, one of my most orthodox friends, uh, most believing friends. Uh, so I had seminary with him uh, for a semester, and he, he always participated. Uh, he knew all the hymns, whatever. Uh, just, like, the most uh, Mormon Mormon you can get. Peter Priest said you could get. Uh, similarly, he never dated, whatever. So th this was uh, a little confusing to see. Uh, and, like, part of the reason I was believing uh, was because I'm like, well, I have all these friends who believe. And not just friends. Uh, it would be very proud to say I know better than everyone around me. Uh, because I was in a very Mormon bubble. Uh, like, within Utah, but least. Even within then, I didn't interact with ex-Mormons for the most part. Or liberal Mormons. Or liberal Mormons. Yeah. yeah. Or never Mormons. Yeah. So uh, I, I was very much in this bubble. I'm like, I would be, I, I'm the only one who has these questions, I guess. Uh, most people just know it's true and believe and have their testimonies. And I might have my testimony, but like the reason I'm having questions is because I'm just not being good enough. Um. So then I heard that this guy also uh, had questions, had doubts. Uh, it was a little validating to the part of me that was doubting. Uh, and then I also learned, like, so, so I told him, like, I looked up to him a, a bunch. Uh, that's why I want your advice. He, he replied back, like, I look up to you, too. Uh, you've grown a lot in this last year and I'll, whatever. And I'm like, huh. So if I'm looking up to him and he's looking up to me, what if we're both just believing? Because the, <laughs> e e what if everyone is believing because they look up to someone else who believes? Sounds like an application of logic or even yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So like, like, I, I read that and I instantly thought this. I'm like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> like, how, how deep does this, this get? Do my parents only believe because their parents believed and their peers believed? Like, so I'm like, okay, I, I need to figure out for myself, like, why do I believe? Because um, I can't rely on other people's belief. Uh, so I, I came up with, like, a few reasons why I believed. Like, one, prophets see God. Uh, there, there's the story Wendy Nelson gave about how, like, she wakes up sometimes in the middle of the night and the spirit tells her to leave. So, 
uh, Nelson, R- Leave Russell the Nelson. bedroom where, where yeah, the yeah. prophet sleeps. Yeah, yeah. So that Russell Nelson can have like his spiritual experiences. And I'm like, wow, okay. So President Nelson has probably uh, talked with God. Because um, presumably she would leave the room so that God could appear. Yeah. So that he and yes, Nelson yes, yes. could speak, whereas God wouldn't appear if Wendy was there. Yeah. And then there's like a bunch of other general conference talks where apostles would say stuff like, I have a special witness of Christ. I know he lives. Stuff like this. Like I know in ways that are too sacred to explain. Just like the apostles in Jesus's time. I know he lives. I'm like, well, those apostles literally saw Jesus get resurrected. Walked around with him. Hmm. Well, and saw him like after he died. Right. So I'm like, he must have seen God as well. I think this was uh, Holland who said this. Mm -hmm. Um, So... So I'm like, okay, this is one of the reasons I believe, because these people have actually seen and talked with God. Uh, why else have I believed? Uh, I, I don't remember the other reasons. Um, so I, I think that was one of them. Uh, th- 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 there's a couple others. Uh, but like slowly as like more questions had been coming up, uh, most of my reasons for believing had disappeared. Oh, what, what, what another of the reasons I believed. Uh, when I was like 10, I uh, tried applying Moroni's promise, and I felt like... Of course, the, the the church is true. I've known this all along. Of course, the Book of Mormon is true. Uh, so that that was another reason I believed. Um, but talking with like my ex Mormon friend, uh, it, it became very clear that lots and lots of people have very similar spiritual experiences. And uh, like at, at the time, I just kind of wanted to dismiss them. Like, sure, lots of religions have truth, but like mine is the one true one. Uh, but I'm like, maybe maybe if I've, there's way more Muslims who believe in the Quran. Maybe it's a little proud to say, uh, I believe in Mormonism because of the Book of Mormon and because I feel I have a spiritual witness of that. So I'm like, okay, I I can't rely on that for my belief. So all I really have at this point, uh, after my patriarchal, this is uh, like a day after my patriarchal blessing, uh, I'm like, I'm figuring this out. I'm like, okay, the only thing I really have left is that prophets have seen and talked with God, starting from Joseph Smith and even nowadays. So I'm like, let's research this. Let's find out all the prophets who have seen and talked with God. And like, that way I can verify that they actually did and know this church is true. So I did this. Uh, I looked on BYU studies uh, for all of this. uh, And I couldn't find like any stories. I'm like, okay, maybe it's just because it's too sacred. Uh, But then I did find like one story and it was about Lorenzo Snow uh, seeing God in the temple. but then on BYU studies, I found a paper that basically completely debunked this. Uh, it, it was a, a third account rumor. Uh, and so, like, okay, so since Joseph Smith, there is, has literally been no revelation, like no, no talking with God. Um, so uh, in, in fact, then I also like learned that there's at least three uh, presidents of the church who in – at least two, maybe three, uh, who, who stated publicly that they had never seen God and all they had was uh, the the feeling from the Holy Spirit that told them their church was true. And like, these are the, the prophets who claim to speak to God and they have not actually. In fact, their witness is no more special than mine. It's no more special than a, a Muslim's. It's no more special than a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, so at this point, I'm like, yeah, it, it can't be true. Like, there's literally no reason to believe anymore. And you were thinking of Muhammad, right? And other prophets of other yeah. faith traditions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so at this point, I'm like, there, there's literally no reason to believe. And all of the questions I had piled up, uh, anachrisms in the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the Book of Abraham not matching uh, the Egyptian translation. Because I, at one point, I'm like, huh, this would be actually really great. Uh, we have... Uh, we can translate ancient Egyptian now. Let's just trans- let's look up the translated version of the papyrus. I'm like, wait a second, this doesn't match up. But at the time, I'm like, maybe it was just like some revelation from God that was like, like some some apologetic. But once I'm like, there's no reason to believe in the church in the first place. All these questions, are like, wow, these are all evidence that the church is not true. And so, like, I instantly, not instant, like a- after I figured this out, I'm like, yeah, it's all not true. Um, and so, like. All- Were there sources, like when you start talking about anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, mm-hmm. Book of Abraham translation, 
you know, there are websites and podcasts and YouTube channels dedicated oh. to this kind of stuff. Yeah. The CES letter. Did you stumble on any of that? Uh, so I, I avoided anti-Mormon sources. So it was mostly just like reading uh, through the Book of Mormon. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Uh, or like with the Book of Abraham, I'm like, huh, we can actually translate this. With this, this would be a huge boost to my faith <laughs> if just Smith was right here. But then you would have had to find a source that talked about the translation, not... So I actually found an apologetic source uh, that compared the two translations. Like, they ma they kind of match up here, kind of match up here. It was just, like, some special revelation that filled in the gaps that Joseph Smith did. So th th that was the Book of Abraham. I did actually, in 10th grade, once, stumble upon the CES letter. I didn't know it was anti-Mormon, so I was just, like, kind of reading through it. And I'm like, huh, this is, like kind of dumb. They're talking about how uh, the place names in the Book of Mormon are very similar to place names around Palmyra. That's dumb. Who cares about that? Um, and then, like, eventually, I don't know, a third of the way through, I got to, like, actual uh, issues, like, anachronism. And, like, I, I'm just like, oh, okay, this is wrong. I can't keep reading this. So, And when you say anachronisms, you mean, like, horses in Book yeah, of Mormon? Yeah, yeah. Horses steal uh, grain. Things that Mesoamerican didn't have people like, wouldn't have had yeah, during complete the time lack of, the Book of, of like uh also like complete lack of archaeology of archaeological evidence okay okay yeah. but you put the, in 10th grade you put that away yeah i'm like yeah yeah i i can't be reading anti-mormon sources <laughs> okay but then your senior year once you're faced with a real rubber hits the road yeah, yeah. decision you're willing to entertain no 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 I, I was not willing to entertain anti-Mormon sources. I well, would go to the questions church. Questions oh, doubts. Questions, sure. But yeah. that, that, that was true all along. Okay. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In 12th grade, I just like, I, I that's when I actually figured out why do I believe and then looked at, uh, like, looked to prove or disprove that belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, like, I, I would just, like, search the church website for any info I could find. Uh, I slowly pieced together stuff. I remember uh, reading the gospel topic essays. Uh, Do you remember which, which ones were most influential to uh, you? I think the DNA evidence one. DNA in the Book of Mormon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to summarize what that said, basically? Uh, basically said there is uh, zero indication that Native Americans came uh, f from Israelite. Uh, there's no DNA evidence for it. Uh, they said this does not rule out the possible uh, so several other possibilities. I'm like, yeah, no, that's that's complete bunk. <laughs> it, it absolutely is huge evidence against the Native Americans being the ancestors. Uh, sorry, Lamanites being the ancestors of the, the Native Americans. Uh, <laughs> Would you have read the Book of Abraham Gospel Topics essay, where it basically um, admits that the word Abraham basically doesn't even appear in the papyrus anywhere? Uh, I, I don't think I read that one. Okay. Um, Did you know that it admits that? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, the the gospel topic essay in the Book of Abraham basically says the word Abraham doesn't appear anywhere in the papyrus. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think that's, like, too big of an issue, though, because, like, Abraham had a bunch of different names. And, like, even well, Jesus has, like, ten the, different names just, that's just depending the on the language. That's starting point. In other yeah. words, none of the—if if, if even the word Abraham doesn't appear there— None of the content that's in the book of Abraham is in the papyrus. It's a yeah. it's a funerary text about yes, a dude yes. who died and you know Yeah, yeah. So 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 I already did know okay, this. You already so knew that. From so. like the the other apologetic website I found. Okay. So did the polygamy Joseph Smith polygamy stuff bother um, you at all? No, it didn't bother me. I think it would have been a lot better if uh people had talked about Brigham Young and polygamy. Because when it came to Joseph Smith and polygamy, like there's so much less uh hard evidence. Like and the church has denied it for so long, and I don't know, like, if they've hidden evidence, but it's just, like, so much harder to prove. So it's so much easier to dismiss. Well, maybe, like, it was just some spiritual wifery. Uh, but, like, if they talked about Brigham Young, it would have been a lot easier. Like, oh, he was 50 years old and married, like, a 15-year-old? That's absolutely not okay. Hmm. Uh, especially, okay, I think the statistic that would have helped the most is, like, he had something like, what, 32 wives? Brigham? Brigham. I think Brigham had over 50. 50? Okay. I think. He had, uh, I think it was a one-to-one -one ratio of wives to children. Almost exactly. And, like, if I had heard that, I'd been like, oh, well, the whole reason for polygamy was, like, having a bunch of children because there weren't enough men around. But, like, that obviously disproves that. So I think that would have been the best. Uh, okay. When it comes he to polygamy. 55 wives. Okay. And then it was, like, how many children? All... <sighs> I'll, I'll Google it right now. It looks like 57 children. 
Yeah. So two more children than wives. Yeah. And that is an important thing for a math person. Why? <laughs> yeah. It's important because like, uh, the, the apologetics I'd been told for so long is polygamy, uh, especially Brigham Young's time was because they didn't have enough men, men around. They needed to raise up seed. Uh, it, this is also in the DNC, like what it says. So it's what? What? You say it again? Like uh, polygamy is only justified with, uh, in special times when the Lord says so. Wants you can to raise, raise up, up a righteous posterity. Yeah. Raise up a righteous posterity. I think they use the word seed. I'm not yeah, certain. Yeah, okay. yeah. Anyway, a righteous yeah. seed. That's in the Book of Mormon. No, no, that's in the DNC. In the Book of Mormon, it directly contradicts this, but <laughs> that that's another issue. I mean, the Book of Mormon says that a man should have one wife. Unless I, the Lord, want to raise up a righteous seed, I think. No, no, no? it doesn't. Okay. In the Book of Mormon, it says uh, David and Solomon uh, having polygamous wives was an abomination to the Lord. In yeah. the DNC, it says David and Solomon having multiple wives uh, was justified by the Lord to raise up a uh, righteous seed. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit rusty, so I'm looking <laughs> up Jacob. Jacob chapter two, yeah. that's, that's the big, that's the big quote. And it says, wherefore my brethren, hear me and hearken to the word of the Lord for there shall be not any man among you, save it be one wife and concubine shall you have none. For if I will say the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise they shall. Hearken oh, unto okay. These you're, you're right. It, it's no big deal. Yeah. But, but they, I think the point you were trying to make is the Book of Mormon is saying it's about seed. It's about children. Yes. So if Brigham Young's having one wife per, one child per wife. It, it's obviously it's, not that way. Yeah. 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 Like my mom had five children. So like you would expect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually mathematically true. Polygamous marriages, they, they've done analyses. Mm -hmm. Polygamous Mormon marriages in the 19th century yielded less children per wife than mm -hmm. than non-polygamous marriages. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. polygamy wasn't a big issue because I don't think it was like brought up in that okay. manner. Yeah. Okay. But if I did know that, I would have been like, wow, that actually is a huge issue. What about like evolution, age of the earth, uh, Noah's Ark, science, yeah. science stuff? You know, I think the apologetics were a little stronger there. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for you, the big ones were, and even if, even if subsequent Mormon prophets after Joseph Smith never claimed to have seen God face to face, Joseph Smith did. What did you do with that? Oh, I'm just like, uh, he, he, he was a con man. Whoa. <laughs> and what made you arrive at that conclusion about Joseph Smith? Oh, because like, obviously Muhammad was a con man, not, not just a con man. He like, he did so much worse than that. Like. And this has happened for so many different religions. So, like, obviously that's what had to have happened with Joseph Smith. <laughs> so if there's hundreds or thousands of other men or women who claim to have seen God, yeah, why is Joseph any different than all the others? Yeah, if yeah, they yeah. can't all be true, so maybe they're all false? Yeah. Well, there's the option that one's true and the rest are false. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, uh, Joseph Smith, it's, it's so much easier with Joseph Smith to dismiss him compared to like other uh, supposed prophets. Why? Because he he went to court over treasure digging. Yeah. Um, he he uh, sacrificed what, a pig to try to find treasure and or didn't goat find or treasure. Or dog or something. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, it's just so much easier when. Yeah. 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 So the, you're studying this stuff your senior year of high school? Yeah. And so, are you bringing these issues to your parents? I mean, no. your dad's a BYU professor. He's super smart. Your mom's super orthodox. Why wouldn't you want to talk to your parents about all this? So, I mean, like occasionally uh, we would just like talk about deep doctrine and it was like in a very pro-church way. Uh, but... Theoretically, your parents should be your safest people oh. on the planet oh, no, they were to talk absolutely about not. your doubts and questions about the church. No, like from as early as I can remember, like I would always just keep my own thoughts to myself. Because um, they weren't safe to talk about. Yeah, I mean, like obviously what happened when I told them I was considering not going on a mission right away. Uh, that, that was just like one thing. But like in general, I didn't feel too safe going to them, uh, talking talking about girls, talking about anything so certainly not mm. religious truth claims. Certainly not religious truth claims. Okay, so you kept that to yourself. <laughs> yeah, and then did you? Yeah. Were you able to talk to anyone about it? Um, did you have anyone? So to, you I, I had this ex-Mormon friend who I could talk to. 
Uh, and, and that was like about it. And was she into this stuff? Uh, I Were mean, these intellectual issues part of why she left? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, she she was very smart. Um, so in your parents' mind, she led you out of the church. Oh, absolutely. My parents absolutely didn't like her. Uh, like, wow. Yeah, they said lots of bad things about her even before I left. E- even before like I was seriously doubting. Well, would they be true that she led you out of the church? No. Why not? Because like. Almost all the issues she brought up, I already had seen at some point, but just had, like, the apologetics. Um, I, I would say, like, uh, not feeling like I was crazy for having questions. Like, that's what she contributed. Um, and also, like, pushing me to uh, actually think about these things for myself mm. and be a little more critical. So she normalized doubts and questions, and she encouraged you to think for yourself. Yeah. And in that way, she was mm. evil. She was to, uh, what? From your parents' perspective. <laughs> well, I, I don't think they even really know about that. Uh, oh, they, okay. they, they, did, they just noticed like that she had boyfriends in high school. Oh, okay. And she dyed her hair once. <laughs> and, uh, like stuff like this. That's what did it. Like, okay, actually, one of my uh, best friends who still believes in, in Mormonism, uh, like they also don't like her. But like she's literally one of the best Mormon girls I know. <laughs> And, uh, like, they, they don't like her because she had like a boyfriend in high school. Mm, okay. So it's like okay. the, the, their bar for not liking people was pretty uh, low. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. I guess you concluded, was there like this moment where you concluded it wasn't true? And yeah. can, can you want to tell us like that moment? Yeah. The moment is uh, I, I, I looked up, so I, I found this one uh, very pro-Mormon site that was talking about, look at all of these prophets who have seen and talked with God. This prophet, this did, this prophet did, this prophet did, blah, blah, blah. This prophet, maybe when he said like something like, I have an ap- apostolic witness. Uh, so like, it's like, he, he was like something like 10 maybes, three no's, and like two for sure's or something like this. <laughs> and like, or like three for sure's. One of the for sure's was like Lorenzo Snow, which I saw actually wasn't true. One of the other ones was actually like in a dream. I'm like, yeah, no. Uh, Cause like, just like a couple months ago, I dreamed about some computer science problem. I'm like, yeah, n- I-, I think. Dreams don't count. Yeah, dreams don't count. <laughs> so, so basically uh, w- 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 when I saw this, I'm like, wow, this is a very pro Mormon site. <laughs> and it basically is proving to me that no prophet has seen God uh, or has cla- even claimed to see God since Joseph Smith. Uh, and so at that moment, I'm like, okay, like, this is my, the, the last reason I had for believing and it's not true. So I'm done. It's not true. Yeah. Uh, so when that moment hit, like, I just like started crying. Uh, I'd gone back from cross country practice a little bit ago. So I went and took a shower. I was just like crying the whole time in the mm-hmm. shower. I, I couldn't stop. Uh, so I just like shut off all emotion, uh, which I, I knew how to do practice. Mm. (laughs) Um, so I shut off all emotion for like about a month Uh, usually I would just do that for like a couple minutes when I was angry at someone Uh, but you know being angry is a sin Um, but like it was about a month because I'm like I can't cry uh, constantly Uh, and like uh, about a week later I'm like okay maybe I'll be fine Uh, so I I started loosening up during cross country practice but then like I started crying again so I'm just like yeah no (laughs) So for like basically a month, uh, I didn't feel any emotion. Mm. You shut it all off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because cause do, you, do you have a sense for why you were blocking that off? Yeah, because I didn't want to just like cry a bunch when I had things to do. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you just packed it all down. Yeah. And then did that build up? No, didn't build up. Okay. Slowly got better. Then I got angry. Uh at the church. Um, what, what were you angry about? Uh, angry about, like, all the missed opportunities, all the lies, all the uh, indoctrination, like, so many lessons in seminary about how to arrive at truth, which were just so wrong and kept me in this cult for so much longer than, like, I could have been. So what what was wrong about the way the church taught you to arrive at truth? Yeah, so in seminary, they, they said, like, uh, you should— when you have questions, you should ask from a faithful perspective. Uh, you should seek uh, only divine sources, which means like no anti-Mormon sources. You should talk to your bishop, your parents, uh, the scriptures, 
God, uh, you shouldn't ever be looking at any other sources that will not tell you that the church is true. Like basically the entire way you're supposed to seek for truth has only one conclusion that you could possibly arrive at. And that is the church is true. Um, What's yeah. scientifically invalid about asking for a confirmation that it is true? I mean, <laughs> like... Have you studied about the null hypothesis and how the, the like, bases of science? Uh, uh, th there's one thing is, like, if something can't be disproven, then it has no... Uh, it, it doesn't add any information into your life. So, like, that, that that's a big issue. That's more of a rationality thing than a scientific perspective. Um, from a more scientific perspective, it's like... Uh, you should f seek the evidence first and come to the conclusions later. Um, and the church... And the church is like, you already have the conclusion. Now you need to seek only evidence that aligns with that conclusion. And for mm. someone who's scientifically minded... And, like, I, I, my, my mind was so distorted because I, I was trying to follow that because I thought it was a sin to even read stuff that was anti-Mormon. Yeah. Or I, I wouldn't even classify as anti-Mormon. Just read stuff that uh, was neutral. Like, I thought the Wikipedia articles on Mormonism were wrong to read because uh, they weren't completely pro-Mormon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So then once you're willing to say, is this epistemology valid? Is this way I'm being taught to determine truth valid? You're willing to ask yourself that question. You start applying the logic. No, 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 no. In the science, no? No, I didn't start doing that until I'd already come to the conclusion the church wasn't true. That's, because yeah. If the church is true and, and then I somehow get tricked and led away by anti-Mormon sources, wouldn't that be awful? Yeah. So like, I, I didn't. I only would look at pro-Mormon sources. Right, but now I'm now I'm, I'm fast forwarding back to the time where you're, you're, you felt anger. Okay, yeah, you yeah, said yeah. You felt anger because of the way the church church taught you to mm -hmm. determine truth. Yes. So, yeah. So then I would look, I, then I, uh, I, I found like read an ex-Mormon. Uh, I, I actually investigated a lot more of the history. I'm like, okay, wow. Like there's so much more I didn't know. I only had the very surface level. Mm -hmm. And even then I thought that was like the big questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so like now I'm like, wow, there's so much more wrong. I didn't even know. Such as? Such as, um, all right. For example, with blacks in the priesthood, uh, I thought this was some, it, I thought it was a priesthood ban because uh, church members were racist. Um, <laughs> then when I found ex-Mormon Reddit, I learned it wasn't just a priesthood ban. It was, they weren't allowed to get saving ordinances in the temple. Um, I also learned that, uh, I found the quotes like by Brigham Young, that uh, it's because of the mark of Cain. They won't until they're the very last uh, they will they will be the very last people to ever receive the priesthood. Uh, I found uh, letters the first presidency wrote in like the 1900s uh, saying, no, this is doctrine. Absolutely. Like, I thought it wasn't doctrine. Well, I, I was iffy. I wasn't sure if it was doctrine or not. Uh, yeah. And then, like, this also helped a lot when it came to uh, when it came to LGBT issues, because. Uh, I would say I was absolutely homophobic when I was in the church because that's what I was taught, uh, the family proclamation, whatever. Uh, but, like, being able to come out uh, and realizing how wrong the prophets were about blacks in the priesthood, uh, this was actually even before uh, I realized Mormonism was false. I started wondering, like, wait a second, what if, if they were wrong about uh, black people not being able to get the priesthood, what if they're wrong about gay people not being able to get married? Um, but I... I that I, I didn't consider that too seriously, but once I actually left, I'm like, yeah, like they actually were wrong about all of this. Um, if they could be wrong about black people, they are almost certainly wrong about LGBT people. I mean, like I, I, I once I left, I didn't even believe they had any authority to, to begin with, but like <laughs> yeah. it, it definitely uh, helped to know how wrong they were about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it bug you that they tried to shift their position? to with, with with black people in the priesthood and saving ordinances well we know it was really never doctrine to begin that with that bugs me so much i had a seminary teacher who <laughs> who told me this so this was when i was orthodox and repeat it for the never mormons what what you were told okay so this was in 12th grade i was still believing this was first semester in seminary my seminary seminary teacher said like he he actually he was actually pretty intellectual he tried a lot uh and he brought up like we're gonna have a day uh, where I'm going to discuss some of the hard questions, like relax in the priesthood. So he talked about this, and he's like, uh, this is a big issue. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what to say about this. Um, my best guess is uh, that 
some early church leaders were just racist, and this is why it happened. And I, I said, no, that's not true. Like, I, I, I raised my hand, I'm like, no, that's not true. This was absolutely doctrine. Uh, and, like, if they're wrong about this, then how do we know they're not wrong about gay marriage? Uh, like, th I said this in seminary as a completely believing Mormon. And I was instantly, like, everyone was against me in seminary. I'm like, whoa, is this what ex-Mormons feel like every single day here in Utah? <laughs> what was everyone else saying? I, everyone's like, I, I don't even know what they were saying. But just, like, like comments like, no, you have to have faith in the prophets and you have to follow the prophets. And, like, uh, even if... The, like, if they're imperfect, like, the, the prophets may be imperfect, but the church is perfect. Stuff like this. Um, so you were looking for logical consistency, yeah. and they were willing to break with logical consistency if it reinforced faith. So in your mind, if if they got it wrong about black people and the priesthood and temple ordinances, then you can't trust them about LGBT people. What they wanted to say yeah. was, no, 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 listen, they can be imperfect. They got it wrong about black people and mm -hmm. the temple, but they certainly, because they're modern prophets, are getting it right about LGBT people. Yeah. So right. So I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't quite so against that because I wasn't. I, I didn't know how doctrinal it was yet. I hadn't seen all this, all, all the stuff on Ex Mormon that like actually proved that it was just as doctrinal as uh, the Family Proclamation is the now. The seminary teacher wasn't providing you with the evidence. Yeah. No. No, no. Like, I, I think actually he did pull up the Brigham Young quote. But what about the doctrinal assertions of the First Presidency? Because the Mormon yeah. First Presidency in the 20th century yeah, yeah. So, provided multiple doctrinal statements affirming the priesthood ban on black people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did so he I, provide I, you with I that? didn't know about this back he, then. He didn't provide you with that information. Yeah, no. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's just brother make mistakes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if he even was aware of this. Oh, okay. Well, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like he was a seminary teacher, but like, I don't think seminary teachers know that much more. But you had to go to ex Mormon Reddit to learn the truthful history about the Mormon yes. church as a 12th grader in Utah, right? Yeah. You're like, going we, to daily, you're is, going to, I just want to make this point. Yeah. You're going to daily religious instruction. Yeah. Hour a day for four years of high school. And you weren't getting the factual, truthful history about yeah. the church, correct? My school actually was every other day. Like, okay. I had a block schedule. But uh, every other yes, day. yes, yes, yes. Okay. But like, yeah, for four to six hours a week, uh, I was getting religious instruction. And there was so much history I didn't even know. Yeah. And I was actually like, this is one of well, this was one of the reasons I didn't like seminary that much, especially ninth, tenth grades, is because I'm like, we're not learning anything in this. It's just the same platitudes over and over again. They're reinforcing faith. They're not yeah. actually educating. Yeah. 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 So you got super angry yeah. when you when you realized that the church wasn't what you thought. Yeah. And you felt like it had wasted your time. How could you have? What does? What different decisions would you have made earlier? if you didn't believe the Mormon church was yeah. true? So first of all, one decision I am so glad I hadn't made yet was whether or not I was going to MIT. This was before I had to commit. So that decision luckily did not change. Um, but some decisions that like could have changed, uh, my parents, if we were not Mormon, would have stayed in New Mexico. I would have still had that community. Um, mm -hmm. when, in high school, I would have like had many more friends then because I would have been in New Mexico. I had several friends. I had. Uh, one friend who got into MIT from New Mexico, um, he ended up actually going to Stanford. But, like, I, I had lots of really smart friends there. Also, um, your parents wouldn't have been telling you to stay away from non-Mormons and ex-Mormons, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And women and girls, you know. I wouldn't have wasted so much time. I would have been able to date in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certain I could have dated in high school. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's also, like, so much mentally beating myself up for things that weren't even wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, like wanting to kiss girls isn't wrong. But yeah, <laughs> as it turns out. Yeah, <laughs> you would know. <laughs> and if somebody says, well, dating in high school just will get you into trouble, what would you say about that? Um, I would say that, like, for lots of kids, it absolutely can uh, be a waste of time or, like, get you into trouble. But I was always a very mature kid. And like, I could have dated in high school and been responsible. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So lots of wasted time slash decisions that you would have made differently. And lack uh, opportunities I missed. Yeah. Mm. 
missed opportunities. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. There's the there's the defective epistemology, and then there's just you said feeling yeah. deceived. Yeah. I I feel like the defective uh, epistemology is actually really really bad because uh, like I spent so long trying to train my rigor. And then, like, this huge glaring hole in rigor because of the church. Like, and all the mental twisting I had to, to do. Yeah. Uh, may, yeah, it just made it so much harder to think clearly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you, I mean, you said what you loved about math and science was that it helped you understand reality. Yeah. So you're, you're caring about math and physics and even chemistry and others, because it's helping you understand the real world. Yet the most prominent and important part of your life, which is your religion, seems to be distorting your reality by withholding information and teaching yeah. you to understand reality in an, in a distorted, ineffective yeah. way. Is that right? Yeah. I'd also say like some things uh, Mormonism taught like affected my life in a bad way. For example, I feel like I was a lot more horny as a teenager because of Mormonism mm -hmm. because like, because like one, I couldn't date, but like I wanted to, um, kind of like I, I got to the point where like I convinced myself I didn't actually want to date. Um, but also like the constant pressure to get married young. Um, so I felt like, like I, I remember thinking as an 18 year old, like I should be getting married soon. Maybe like don't go to mission on a mission, but like go to college and get married in a year or two. Like that was my thoughts because plenty of girls do this. It's less common among, among guys, but like most guys still are getting married like 22, 23 in Mormonism and mm -hmm. girls. It's like 18, 19, 20. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had a friend who went to BYU, uh, a year older than me. Uh, so I was still in high school and she was telling me how like half of her freshman class was married. Not, it's probably wasn't actually half, but like a huge number people in her dorms are just like leaving mm -hmm. to go into the married dorms. I'm like, yeah. wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's what I should want to do. And so that's what I started wanting to do. Yeah. Um, which is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So, wow. You, you suppressed your emotions. Then you started feeling angry, mm -hmm. but you still hadn't told your parents, right? Still hadn't. No, no, no. So I, I think I did tell my parents okay. uh, very soon after I lost my faith. Uh, in fact, I, I'm not actually sure. Maybe... Uh, Maybe I've mixed up, like, my timeline with uh, when I told them I didn't want to serve a mission uh, and I left the church. Because it might have been when I left the church, I told them. And that's when I felt pressure to tell them okay. uh, instead of like, when, when, when I was you questioning can go back the timeline. You can go mission. Back. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. But have you? I'm, it might, it, it might have been then. So tell uh, us what you haven't told us about the, the story. So you telling yeah. them you're not serving a mission, that sounds like a big thing. So... Oh, okay. So I actually, I'm not entirely sure how, uh, that happened, but, uh, I, let's see. Do you think the telling them about the mission part okay. was tied to your he, here's belief? Here's what it is. He, here's what it is. I think, uh, when I first told them, what well, I said earlier about like when I told them I was questioning a mission, this was actually, that didn't happen. I think I told them, I questioned like, is a mission the right thing in front of them? But like, they never said anything about that. Uh, it's when I left the church. And then I ended up uh, telling them that uh, I didn't want to serve a mission. Um, I didn't believe in the church anymore, or I, I don't think I believe in the church anymore. I, I think I was a lot less certain until I'd like read more history. I was pretty sure, but like not mm. super certain. Uh, let's see. So I, I felt like a little pressured uh, in that conversation. Not too much. Uh, my mom got mad at me. She like immediately went to tell my brother, my twin brother, like, do not talk to James anymore so basically for like a month we didn't talk to each was other this in high school this was in high school senior year mm. so your twin brother your mom tells your twin brother not to talk to you anymore is that right uh yeah i i don't know if she said like explicitly don't talk to him anymore mm. but like I, I i don't know what she said but like this is what uh joseph event said it was something like this okay. how he, james has it, it is an evil ex-mormon it was the vibe um mm, okay so, so joseph didn't knew this for about a month but like uh, I, I had gotten my parents to promise they wouldn't actually talk, talk to other people about this because I wanted it to be personal, this conversation. And so it was and like- So you sat them down oh. and said what? So, so, so we were in their room sitting down talking about this. I'm like, okay, like I, I want you guys to not talk to others about this because it's kind of private. And, and you they, told they, them what? 
You just said mom and dad. Uh, I'm not sure I believe in the church anymore. I'm not, I don't want to go on a mission, stuff like that. As a senior in high school. Yeah. That's something no Mormon parents ever want to hear. Yeah. 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 So, and, and did they cry? Were they angry? It, so, so my afraid? mom was a, a little angry, uh, but my dad was a very calming presence. He, he's like, calm down. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think my dad was disappointed. Um, he, he took it pretty well, though. Uh, I got them to both promise to keep it private, but they didn't. My mom went and immediately told my brother, Yeah. Uh, told him to avoid me. Uh, huge breach mm-hmm. of trust. Uh, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so my twin brother uh, is kind of like knows this, but isn't supposed. But she's like, "Don't tell James. I told you this." <laughs> um, so not not saying anything about it. But he does treat me a little differently. Um, about a month later, uh, Joseph's deciding like, "Okay, I need to actually figure out if I'm going to MIT." He he's also has the same decision, right? Um, so. Uh, so he, he pulls me aside and he's like, hey, James, I want you to tell me all the reasons Mormonism isn't true mm. or why you don't wow. believe. So I told told him this. Like we had, I don't know, 10, 15 minute discussion. And like he's like, OK, yeah, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like that. Uh, like once he had someone he could actually talk to about these issues, uh, someone he, like he could actually trust to have good epistemics because like I was – like I was winning math competitions with him. He he knew I was pretty logical and smart about this stuff. And maybe the top five things you would have told him would have been what? Um, I think I told him uh, Book of Abraham, uh, DNA evidence, and anachronisms. Uh, in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Uh, polygamy. And then, yeah, I, stuff okay. like that. Okay. I, I don't know. Treasure digging, one. Joseph's treasure digging. First. Mm, probably not that. Uh, maybe what about- I, I might have talked about Joseph Smith's polygamy, how he married like 20 wives before Emma. Yeah. And what about the, I guess, prophets not seeing God? Would you have mentioned that to him? Uh, I think so, too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just, like, sped run through them. And, and he like, got it in 15 minutes. Got it in 15 minutes. Mm. Of course, like, he'd been a lot more, uh, hmm, a le- he, he, he'd never been as uh, into the church as I was. So, uh, mm. like, yeah. I, I, I definitely had... Uh, Scrupulosity, I think he might have had a little, but much less. Uh, even when he was like seven, uh, it, he, he tried to apply Moroni's promise and it didn't come. So like starting from then, he'd always been a little more hesitant to say the church is true. So if this guy's, if this brother's your twin. Yeah. And for months and months and months, you're going through this harrowing experience of deconstructing Mormonism, questioning its validity. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, because so many twins are like, almost joined at the hip in terms of mm-hmm. their what the, how they spend their time together, what they do, how close they are, you would think you would have been talking to your twin brother mm. about this all the way along. I, I tried to keep personal matters outside of family. Mm. Um, so also like my twin and I weren't super close uh, because like he had done a little better in math competitions than me. I think I was jealous. Um, and then... Also, like, I don't know, in ninth and 10th grades, he was, like, very close to me. But, like, I wanted to make friends with other people. And so I felt like he was uh, stopping me because he was, like, always, like, tied to me. So, so you had to kind of break away from him yeah. a little bit so, to make so, other friends. Yeah. So in high school, we weren't uh, super close. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So once he – wow. But then I'm I'm sure once you tell Joseph – about what you've learned, and in 15 minutes, he concludes the church isn't true. Now you're really worried about what your mom and maybe out. your parents are going to think and feel. Oh, no, it was actually very nice because, like, I I, I, I didn't actually talk to them about ex-Mormonism at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I had someone I could talk to about this. Mm-hmm. And we could laugh and make jokes together about mm-hmm. <laughs> Brigham Young, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so it was very nice, but my parents got like really mad. <laughs> they did? But yeah, my, my dad's like, you need to stop disrespecting our religion in our house. Oh, you would make jokes about Oh yeah, in, in the prof- public, in the family rooms, we just make jokes like this. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, to a Mormon parent, that's like apostasy. Your oh, yeah. kids are apostatizing. You know, they would say there's a dark spirit here. You're mocking yeah, they, our they, sacred they, things. They, they say like, you need to stop mocking us in our religion. I think one time we pulled up their temple names because like it's the same name for every single person just on the day of the month. The, so the whatever date they went through the temple, yeah. they would have been assigned those <laughs> temple names. They got, so you were able to figure out your, your parents' oh, temple man. names. Yeah. That's supposed to be secret and yeah. no one's supposed to know. So you told your parents you knew their temple names? Yeah, yeah. And they got like kind of pretty oh, wow. mad about that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well. Yeah. But like we committed to MIT. We're like, yeah, we, we can't go to BYU anymore. <laughs> um, so we're like, we just, we're going to be gone in a couple months. We don't care too much. And like th they weren't even really willing to sit down and talk to us about this stuff. Mm. So like we're just going to talk to each other and who really cares. Uh, so we grew a lot closer. Uh, we bonded over ex-Mormonism, kind of. Um, yeah, so my older brother got back from his mission that summer, uh, summer before we left to MIT. Um, and honestly, he wasn't that much different than when he left on his mission. Uh, I felt like when people go on a mission, they're supposed to grow. This is why I was taught. You grow so much. Uh, but like he got back and he didn't seem any more mature. Mm. Um, and also like he didn't, he thought very, very poorly of us because he'd known we were ex-Mormon now. Mm. Um, so we didn't get along too great that summer. Mm. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, he also got mad because we were making fun of his faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but honestly, like, yes, we were making fun of it a little, but like it was, to each other and we could have been a lot more disrespectful if we really wanted and they weren't very respectful to us either like they completely refused to talk to us yeah like the believing mentality is that making jokes are amount to like sacrilege and disrespect yeah but if you're feeling downpowered and alone and isolated humor can be a way of coping and processing mm -hmm. And even reprogramming your brain emotionally. Yes. And so it comes across as evil and disrespectful. But I wonder if that's a way to shame you and keep you from doing the processing yeah. that you need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not that you want to be mean and disrespectful. Yeah. But you're just a couple well, of kids trying to figure out your lives, well, right? We're just saying it to each other to have fun. Yeah. And like, yes, the process. Um, like it, it didn't really have much to do with them, but they took it very personally. You weren't trying to mock and disrespect yeah. them or were you? Uh, I think I, I didn't care if I mocked or disrespected them. Their beliefs. Uh, their beliefs. Sorry. Not them. Their beliefs. Yes. So I guess there's always the position that some beliefs are so absurd or harmful. Yeah. They're worthy so, of disrespect. So that, that is my current opinion that like, uh, like just they are so absurd and disrespectful. And like, if you don't uh, fight back against it, it's like acknowledging that it is okay to have those beliefs when it really isn't. Like it's keeping people in the bubble when they shouldn't be. Like, for example, I have a cousin. Uh, we had a family, a wedding. Uh, so he, he's like 14. Uh, he's from out of state. So from Colorado, but he's like never met an ex-Mormon somehow. Uh, and he's like, see, he, he's so... So, so he asked me, that, yeah, like, I've never met an ex-Mormon, but I've heard you guys are ex-Mormon. Like, why do you believe that way? And I, I was just shocked. I'm like, you've never met an ex-Mormon. And not only do you not live in Utah, but, like, you're 14 years old, a sophomore in high school. Like, and, and this was true for my life, too. Like, and it's because uh, there's this shield that Mormons have when, like, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to talk badly about their faith when their faith is bad. And when you say Mormon faith is bad, what do you mean? I mean, it is uh, it is hurting people to teach them that faith because, like, it makes it harder for them to think properly. Um, like, for a time, I was doubting evolution because of this Mormon faith. And if somebody says, well, evolution's bad and it's okay to doubt that, like, w what's wrong with a faith that persuades people to not have faithless thoughts? Yeah, it's because there's so many other issues that uh, because of uh, that the religion tries to enforce. Like, for example, uh, the Mormon church. I, I learned this from ex-Mormon Reddit. Uh, the Mormon church spent 
a ton of money uh, advertising against for for Prop Eight in yeah. California, right? To fight same-sex marriage in California, yeah. yeah. Um, and like I myself was homophobic because of the Mormon faith. Yeah. Um, and like so many other th- small things, like well, actually I don't know if you even counts as small not being able to date. Like so many other things that personally wronged me, but like I had it good compared to most people. I am a straight white male in Mormonism, like yeah. that, and, and like I was top of my class, like that, that, that's one of the best situations to be. And even then I felt hurt by Mormonism. Mm-hmm. Like imagine being queer. Or maybe a woman or a person or, of color. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you you and your brother both leave the church. Do you stop attending and does your ward care? Okay. So, uh, we decided to keep the peace and, attend that summer. Your uh, home ward. Uh, our home ward. Prior to MIT. Prior to MIT, yeah. yes. It was, uh, we were, there was a very obvious uh, change in personality though. Like, I, I remember how I was mad at people being on their phones. I was that guy on my phone all during Sunday school, priesthood <laughs> quorum, because I don't care about this, like, stuff. It, it, it's not meaningful. Turns out it has its, its phones, function. Phones have their advantages yeah. at church once you no longer believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. 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 But you, you, you so, and your brother kept attending to keep the peace. Yeah. So I was actually second counselor, right, in free scorm at the time. I was second counselor for about two months <laughs> while ex Mormon, and that believer. was like a little, uh, very much imposter syndrome. I think I had to actually give like a short talk on, uh, in a combined. Act- uh, fifth ward thing on missionary <laughs> work. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which was, so I was actually very glad because it, it was like all the youth, not all the youth, like several of the youth were giving short couple minute snippets. Uh, I was very glad the person before me took like 15 minutes. So I only had like two minutes to talk. So I just said something like missionary service is serving other people. Even if you just like go on a run with someone who's feeling lonely, that's missionary <laughs> service. <laughs> yeah. Depending on broadly. Did you ever have that interview with your bishop where he's like, why aren't you serving a mission kind of thing? Uh, so I did have it. Uh, it was a, actually, I, I was going to get my temple recommend interview schedule it i'm just like yeah i'm not getting a temple recommend <laughs> but uh why were you why was that even coming up were you asking for temple uh, recommend? It, it had expired no because uh the, the the bishop and like the counselors just try to make sure all the youth have temple recommends have current temple recommends yeah so yours was expiring yeah and my bishop had like interviews every six months with all the yeah. youth so mine mine was expiring or had expired uh <laughs> i was i wasn't going to renew it but uh I, I did decide, like, I'll just go and tell the bishop, like, yeah, this is, I'm not doing this anymore. How'd that, uh, how'd that go? It, it, it was really good. He's super nice. Uh, he's like, yeah, lots of youth have been saying similar things. <laughs> <laughs> he was just a youth leaving the church. I mean, there's a perception that, yeah. that the youth in 2023 are hemorrhaging out of the Mormon church. They absolutely are. Is can you So can you speak to, we're talking in... Provo or Orem, Utah, Mm -hmm. like Utah County in the shadow of BYU. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, in my ward, we had somewhere around 25 priests, supposedly in priest quorum, Uh, usually 10, maybe 15 on a good day would show up actually to priest quorum. Uh, In terms of missions, maybe then three to five would go on a mission each year. What the? So you're saying... Around half of your priests in your ward were even attending church. Yeah. And of the 25 priest age men, young men, two to three actually ended up serving missions in Provo. I, I would say three, three to, to five. five. Three to five. Three to five. So in Provo, Utah. Yeah. So what's that? Five, you're a math guy. Five out of 25? Well, no, no, because uh, the priest quorum has uh, two and a half years, right? Okay. Of people. So, so it, what percentage, What if you had to estimate what percentage of young Mormon men from Provo were serving missions? Uh, maybe 25 to 30%. That seems super. I mean, if that if yeah. it's low in Provo and Orem, yeah, how yeah. is it going to be outside of Utah County? Yeah. Uh, one thing, though, uh, like lots of people would go a semester after college. Uh, okay. But I, I think I'm counting these in these numbers. Um, and then... This, I think my word is also a lot more liberal. So among my friend group, a lot more went on missions. It's either you became an ex-Mormon or you didn't, go, or you went on a mission. Mm-hmm. But you're seeing so. a lot of kids in Utah just 
yeah. Mormon kids, raised Mormon, faithful parents, just choosing not to serve missions. Yeah. More, more, the, more are not serving than are serving. Um, let's see. Let me think about this. Uh, it, it's more of the uh, people who end up not serving missions disappear from church like six months beforehand. Mm. Uh, so they just peace so out. So I, I don't see them not going on missions. Right. They just disappear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And probably yeah. they don't want to deal with all the social backlash, mm-hmm. right? Also, it's become so much more acceptable for uh, people to come home from their missions early, which is so good. Like there's this uh, there's this one guy on my cross country team who actually was in my ward as well, who came home after like six months or so, uh, and like everyone on the cross country team is like, "Hey, it's good to have you back." Hmm. Uh, same for like another guy on my cross country team. Uh, honestly, I don't even know why he went on a mission in the first place because he sounded extremely nuanced and like he was more there to have an experience than like to go teach people the gospel because he didn't seem like the gospel wasn't like a super important part of his life. Mm -hmm. So it'd be social pressure, right? Yeah. I I think it's absolutely social pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, So you almost were in the majority by telling your bishop you, you weren't going to serve. Um, he was used to it. Yeah. Yeah. He said a lot of youth have been saying similar things. Yeah. I don't know about majority because uh, I I did know. I, I would say an approaching majority. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, hmm, I don't know. It, close there. Yeah. I would just say growing up in Katy, Texas in the 80s, a majority of the young Mormon men, you know, would go to BYU and then go serve missions for mm-hmm. sure. A clear majority. Yeah. And that it sounds like it's not a clear majority in Utah yeah, in I, 2023. I remember uh, in seminary. So ninth and 10th grades, they didn't say anything. In 11th and 12th grades, they say, you need to bring your friends to seminary because like we don't have as many people. We have something like 2,000 students at uh at Timfew, but only like 1,000 come to seminary. Hmm. Uh, and this happened like in 11th and 12th grades. So. Yeah. I, I think, like, in just those years, it dropped significantly. And do you have a sense for, is it similar stuff to you and your brother, why people are piecing out? Uh, probably. Also, probably lots of parents are leaving. Um, and mm. so, like, yeah. You're seeing that, too? Um, I, I don't know if I'm seeing that, too. But, like, I had, there's one girl in my orchestra who uh, who said her parents left when she was, like, 9 or 10. So, mm. And, and they're probably just going to keep increasing. Yeah. Either the children or the parents and the whole family leaving. Yeah. So by the time you and your brother are, are planning to move to Cambridge, mm-hmm. what's your relationship like with your parents? Um, like we don't talk very much. It's not too much different. Like we didn't even talk that much when we were Mormon uh, because uh, like they spent – they. They spent a lot more focus on my younger brother. Uh, he had like medical issues going mm-hmm. on. So – uh, their focus was on him. Um, s- let's see. So, yeah, it, it didn't change too much. So for you, really, the real change, it sounds like, was that you got closer to your brother. Yeah. So my twin brother got a lot closer. Uh, we roomed together at MIT. In the dorms? In the dorms. Um, it, it, was, it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do, do, do your parents have to pay for MIT or are you no. on scholarship? So, uh, so MIT doesn't do academic scholarships. It does do financial aid. And because our family has lots of children, uh, like a Mormon family does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we have three kids in college, right? Me, Joseph, and my older brother. So financial aid was very generous. Okay. So you're able to afford MIT even yeah. if your parents aren't supportive of you yeah. going. And did you, did they make it clear that they were unhappy that you made that choice? Uh, my mom was very unhappy, but like she couldn't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad uh, said like he was very disappointed and very sad and like he's grieving that we left the church, which uh, he, he said something like this. Uh, like I, this was over a phone call while we were at MIT. Like I, I'm grieving that you guys left the church and it hurts a lot and I'm very sad about it. But, like, I know that you're hurting more. And the truth is, like, that's not – I'm not hurting more. I'm not sad that I left Mormonism. I'm very mm. happy that I got out just in the nick of time to go to mm. MIT. Mm. Um, yeah. And, like, 
I may be angry, I may be hurt, but like, I'm not sad anymore. I was sad for a bit when my whole reality turned out to be false. But like, yeah. that was long in the past. But like, I know my parents are still very sad that their children aren't Mormon anymore. I mean, years ago, I coined the idea that like a kid can cure cancer and win the Nobel Peace Prize but they'll still be a disappointment to their Mormon parents if they leave the church. Yep. And you could, you, you, you're already resonating with that. Absolutely. But like <laughs> how many parents in the United States who have decent educations or not would be thrilled to have their, not just one kid, but two kids in the same year go to MIT. And yet instead of your parents just being grateful and ecstatic, yeah. what's it like to have your parents be disappointed that you and your brother are at the top university in the world for math. <laughs> it's like, it's very, I don't know. We, we don't talk that much anymore because stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And, and what's it like that a religion would come between parents yeah. and their kids who are succeeding in life? Yeah. That just seems yeah. so odd. It's a sign of, you use the word cult. I don't like to use that word because sometimes yeah. it alienates people. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying on this program, I tend to not try and use yeah, yeah, that yeah. word a lot because I don't want to offend the people we're trying to reach or impact. But the truth is, any organization that would make parents feel sad or ashamed about their own children mm -hmm. when they're like seceding in life and it's driving a wedge between them and their children, I think that meets criteria for yeah. cult. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, growing up, I was actually... Uh, I was very willing to listen to other people's opinions, uh, as evidenced by, like, talking to this ex-Mormon girl. Um, but when I left, I was surprised at how many people were unwilling to listen. And this includes my parents. And I think – now I think that it's because uh, Mormonism teaches people to not listen mm -hmm. to ex-Mormons. Uh, but, like, I never really – somehow I never got that teaching. So <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. So did you feel prepared? Like, I, I know that university life outside of mm -hmm. a BYU school is very different than university life yeah. at a BYU school, whether it's drinking or yeah, yeah. co-ed dorms or sex or mm -hmm. just free thinking. Did you feel prepared for college? Yeah. So uh, before college, I actually went to two rationality camps. Uh, okay. So have you, do you, have you heard of like effective altruism? Uh, uh -huh. So th these camps are... Uh, run by people with similar thought, like effective altruism. Okay, let's see. Do you know like ra the rationality movement? Less wrong. Um, mm -hmm. That that stuff. Is it kind of secular humanism stuff? Or? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, all all that like is kind of like what these rational like rationality camps are about. Um, and so there, I met like lots of really smart people who are rational, uh, atheist. Uh, they could just talk about having girlfriends, boyfriends, drinking, uh, and say like, well, the, the benefits are is it, it helps you relax a little drinking, um, but like the, obviously it hurts your mental state. So like several of them are like, yeah, I don't really like drinking um, or I don't think I'm going to – like one of them is like, yeah, I haven't ever drunk and I don't think I ever will get drunk. So stuff like this. Uh, so like – be, being able to like talk with a bunch of people who were really smart, uh, had similar morals uh, and values, uh, but also like were atheist was very nice and good preparation for MIT. So when I got to MIT, like I had I, already decided like, yeah, I'm not going to go to parties. I don't really like parties, uh, stuff like that. So talk about that jump. It sounds like you made a jump to atheism. There's a lot of Christians who listen to Mormon stories that are like, mm. hey, they're fine if you leave the Mormon church, but don't throw God and Jesus away. What made you go to atheist once you lost your Mormonism? Okay, so <laughs> like if you are to believe in a God, you should have a reason for believing in a God. And I have seen uh, no good reason to believe in a God of the Bible or a God of any religion that exists on the earth right now. Uh, in fact, like... Uh, like one thing you could say is uh, an explanation that involves God is far more complex than an explanation without God. Like, for example, if you say God created the universe, then you say who created God. Um, and so in general, like 
there's not much of a reason to believe in God. Uh, actually, sorry, there is. Uh, there's no evidence for God. There's, there aren't evidence-based reasons to believe in God that you found. Yes, yes, yes. I, like you could say the Bible, but that's like circular reasoning. Uh, you could say the New Testament, but like those are written hundreds of years after the fact. Um, and there's like so much that didn't get into the New Testament, which uh, anyways. Yeah. So like there's no reason to believe in a God and uh, it, just Mormonism is like a great religion to come out of because then you're like, well, it like obviously then Islam happened in a similar way to Mormonism. You had some con man, uh, Muhammad, uh, who like just went and conquered a bunch of people and said like my religion or death or extra taxes actually is more like it. Um, <laughs> and like same for Christianity, like the Roman empire adopted it. And then it's like, everyone has to now be Christian. Uh, and like you get a bunch of myths that get exaggerated. Like for example, in Mormonism with the seagulls, uh, eating all the crickets, like that absolutely is an exaggerated myth. Um, what about all the people for millennia that have said they've had spiritual experiences confirming a witness of the divine in their life? Uh, well, I think that like disproves religion even more because these people are from tons of different religions who are saying the exact same thing, which means like the spiritual experience isn't coming from their God. It's coming from something else that's underlying. Um, what, what about the idea that God inspires people regardless of their religion? So God's inspiring all of them. They're just getting the particularities wrong. So then that's a God that you don't want to believe in because he is tricking people. Or what if he's giving, I'll just make the arguments. What if he's yeah. just giving them their free agency, letting them, you know, make mistakes or figure things yeah, out because yeah. so, they need to grow. So I, I think though, like that's a very, what if and it's an explanation, but it's not a good explanation because there's so much missing from it. Like, how do you know that that God even exists? Like, for example, like if you have a God, uh, uh, like, Hmm. Okay, there's the argument, yeah. there's the maker. So you, if you stumbled on a watch, you would assume there was a maker who made the watch. Yeah. The universe is far more complex than a watch. Yeah. The universe is super sophisticated. There must be a maker, mm -hmm. just like there'd be a watchmaker. Yeah, so you could go from an uh, anthropologic perspective where it's like we wouldn't even exist if the universe wasn't balanced just enough. Also, like, if you look at the universe, uh, things are kind of the simplest possible in order to get complexity. Like, uh the, uh, let's see, the expansion of the universe is just fast enough so that it doesn't collapse or uh, go out. And like, that's like because- the earth is just the right distance from the sun. Yeah, yeah, but that's because if that didn't happen, then the earth wouldn't exist. <laughs> like we right. wouldn't have a universe that's livable in. Uh, we have a three dimensional universe as opposed to a two dimensional universe because in three dimensions, uh, particles end up being a lot simpler, uh, how they interact, stuff like this. Uh, Okay. So those arguments aren't persuasive to you. Yeah. It, it's like, I look around and like, yeah, like things look like it wasn't complex. It's actually as simple as possible in order to make human life. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. yeah, you, you didn't have a maker coming in and doing all of this. So what about the idea that God's, okay, I think I know what you're going to say here, that God needed to obscure the evidence that because the whole yeah. test in life is for you to have faith and believe in him without evidence. That's the whole point. Yeah. That's the test. So I, I say to that, like, if uh, such a God does exist, there's no point in believing in him because, uh, like, if something is, uh, what's the word for it? I can't remember the word for it. Uh, oh, there it is. If something's indistinguishable, uh, sorry, if the universe with a God is indistinguishable from a, a universe without a God, there is no... Uh, Nothing gained by believing in the God for you, like at least as you're living in this universe. Um, but like when you die, it, it's just it would be so unfair for such a God to exist that say, well, because you didn't make an irrational leap uh, for something that you couldn't possibly know, which also like if you're going to this, the thing like there's so many different universes that are indistinguishable from each other with so many different gods. You could have a god uh, that only cares about aliens on Xerox uh, or <laughs> whatever. Like there's no reason the, the probability that a god uh, is indistinguishable from no god exists and cares about humans and cares about you specifically and cares about like 
you, uh, about two guys not getting married. <laughs> like, it's just so low that it's not even worth thinking about. <laughs> What about the people that say, well, there were witnesses to Jesus resurrecting. There were witnesses yeah. to the miracles that Jesus performed, the, the blind men seeing, the lame walking, yeah. the people who were healed of leprosy. There were witnesses who wrote that down. Uh -huh. That's evidence. I mean, first of all, like, was it uh, one person who was healed of blindness or two? Uh, that's a great question. I am not sure the New Testament answers that. Um, <laughs> So, like, the witnesses aren't very reliable. You also have to keep it, in, uh, like, uh, th there was marijuana, for example, that was, or, what? Well, yeah, I think that was found on, like, an ancient uh, Jewish shrine. Uh, stuff like this, like, people have used drugs for a very long time. When you, you take that into account, when you take into account, like, schizophrenia, when you take into account uh, people not having glasses thousands of years ago, like, it, it makes so much more sense. Uh, the probability is so much higher that the witnesses were wrong or mistaken or even just like made stuff up. So speaking of mathematicians, what about Pascal's wager, which oh, is boy. that <laughs> you, if you're wrong, then you're burning in hell. Yeah. So you don't really lose anything to believe because if you if you're wrong, you lived a good life. Mm -hmm. If you're right, then you get to go to heaven and live with God. Yeah, so have you heard of Pascal's mugging before? <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I have. I am actually a uh, overlord of this universe uh, <laughs> who can control all, aspect, all aspects of it. In fact, I can control many universes. So, like, do you, do you believe me on this? Um, Margie? No. It's a no, no, no for no. me. Okay, no, well, no. He here's the deal. I am going to make um, <laughs> 10 trillion people suffer for eternity in burning flames, if you don't give me $5 right now. So what are you going to do? Like, if you're wrong, uh, then $10 trillion, 10 trillion dollar, sorry, 10 trillion people suffer. But if you're right, like, all you lose is $5. Is, is that, it's worth it, right? <laughs> so you're turning that back and yeah, yeah. saying it could be a way that people manipulate others yeah. to give up yeah. money and power. And also, uh, I think uh, th there's some ar other arguments you can make, like, uh, What's it called? Solomov complexity stuff like uh, you should assign. No, actually, that does that one doesn't work. Um, yeah, there's the, the, there's some other arguments you can make against Pascal's wager. Um, what about what about the idea that that religion and Mormonism make good people? That by their fruits you shall know them. Good families, good fathers, good mothers. Mm -hmm. Good citizens, the fruits are in the excellent quality families and people uh, that Christians and that Mormons produce. Yeah, so like it's a useful lie, is the idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say lie. I, 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 I'm saying it's sorry, useful by fiction. their fruits you shall know them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I, I read this somewhere that uh, it's utilitarian true. I, I read this somewhere that like the common people uh, believe religion is true, the intellectuals believe it is not true, and the politicians believe it is useful mm. <laughs> so uh <laughs> but mm. anyways i think yeah it can be useful like there are some people who might murder a bunch of people if they didn't have religion but like uh i, I still believe informed consent is more important and i also think that most things that uh most good that comes from religion uh can also come just from communities in general uh, there are some things that are unique to religion, which is like having the belief that there is a, a being who personally care, cares about you no matter what is a very positive placebo. Um, like, so th th that is a benefit. But uh, and, and if you have to rely on that, like, sure. But I, I don't think you need to also include a bunch of rules about uh, stoning homosexuals to death in the Bible uh, to have to get that same placebo effect. So I think almost all organized religions uh, are anything positive about them can be almost anything positive about them can be taken from somewhere else. And like the remainder can be taken from just like a religion that isn't an organized one. Well, as someone who's tried to build secular community, it turns out it's pretty hard to build secular community and it's hard yeah. to reproduce the depth uh, of community that a Mormon ward, yeah, you know, this is can, true. can create. Because you have, like, this one common thing with religion. Um, 
I think it's also a little harder in Utah because I noticed that uh, in my neighborhood, there's like events that lots of people go to because they're ward events. But then like all the ex-Mormons, atheists, never Mormons uh, are just completely left out. Uh, and like you don't have an organizing structure that already exists. So you have to like, it has to be recreated from the start, which is a lot, uh, a lot higher activation energy than if it what already exists. And what are things like at MIT in terms of friends and community, mm -hmm. social life for you? Yeah, uh, I didn't try very hard to socialize at MIT. I just like studied. Um, yeah. So do you get lonely there? Are you happy there? A little, um, like, I don't know. I was actually a little disappointed by MIT students. Uh, in what way? In, in what way? Like uh, lots of them. Do, do you know what good harding is? No. Okay. So like lots of them would try to look good on their application, uh, but like didn't actually know a bunch of stuff. Mm. It's called what? Good harding. Good uh, harding? It, yeah. It, it, uh, mm. I don't remember his first name. Goodhart like came with ID. Anytime there is uh, a way to measure success, people instead optimize towards the measure instead of like actually success. Mm. So, like, uh, there there are plenty of smart people at MIT. Lots of smarter people than me. Just like lots of the freshmen I met. Uh, like even at MIT, we're still taking like calculus and stuff that I'd taken years before. So, I didn't care too much to socialize. What about like dating and stuff? Uh, no, I didn't care about that either. More just like, it would be too much effort. <laughs> Is it because it's hard to survive at MIT and thrive and do well no, with all the classes? I think, and... I think it's because, uh, I, hmm, I thought like most of the freshmen were kind of immature. Because <laughs> hmm. I'd been taking college classes for a couple of years. Mm. Um, hmm. So why not date upperclassmen? Why? Because uh, <laughs> I would be too young for them. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's like you spent all that, all those high school years not dating. Yeah. You're now feeling angry that you didn't have that chance. Yeah. Now you've got your chance and you're not yeah, I know. pursuing it. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not calling you out. I'm <laughs> I, just curious. I do curious. feel uh, a little sad about that. Maybe I should try a little harder to date. But. Do you plan on graduating from MIT? Mm -hmm. uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I do not plan on graduating. I do not plan on not graduating either. If I happen to graduate, that'd be nice. If I don't graduate, whatever. What? <laughs> yeah. Is it more kind of learning centered yeah, so, for you? Yeah. So like uh, this last year I was taking mostly like senior level graduate courses. So when it comes to like learning, I don't, I, I could just like go do other majors, but like I'm not super interested in those classes. Uh, so when it comes to learning, I don't feel, I don't know how much value, how valuable it would be to stay another like two years at MIT. Uh, so if I graduate like this year, that'd be great. Uh, if not, like, I, I don't know if I would stick around another year. So what types of classes are you taking? Uh, let's see. Like, uh, last semester I took a game theory course, uh, and then also like a quantum lab course. Uh, what else did I take? I took some like AI classes, but they were really dumb because like, I don't know. Uh, okay. So like I, I read a bunch of AI research papers. So I'm like, eh, this stuff isn't like cutting edge, uh, <laughs> kind of old news. So, so, I mean, you can't turn on a podcast in 2023 without it talking about AI mm. and how AI is dangerous and AI mm -hmm. is going to destroy the world. <laughs> Even the opera Oppenheimer movie about the development of the nuclear mm -hmm. bomb or the hydrogen bomb and whatever, like that's being framed as a warning about what AI is going to do to yeah. us and mankind and civilization. Do you want to give us your, your take on the, the dangers and the perils and the promises of AI? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, uh, AI can definitely be very dangerous. Uh, I think even just in the next couple of years in terms of, uh, where, how, like the money will go towards all the companies that have developed AIs and like workers will just be left with nothing. Um, I think that's like a big issue, but like in a little bit more long term, uh, if you get a general capabilities AI, like that can be very worrying, especially because there's no way to know really what the AI will do. Um, so I think that is a big issue that needs to be solved. Uh, I think it's definitely possible to solve. Um, and I, I think though most efforts being put towards that aren't super useful. So 
Uh, for example, like if you've read Less Wrong, there's lots of posts about finding oh, what? What's it called? Like AI interpretability and whatever. I don't find most of them very useful though because uh, like AI models will change, architectures will change over time. Uh, yeah, so, but yeah, so so there's some people working on this. Uh, probably you need a lot more people working on it. Um, especially another big issue is uh, there's an AI race basically b between America and China right now, uh, and like whichever nation does develop a super intelligence first will probably like destroy the other's economy. So, like <laughs> that. Maybe maybe they won't, but like that's definitely a possibility. So you need to like first work on safety before uh, power. Mm. And is that where you want to focus? Do you want to help be a part of the solution to this problem, or no? I I don't care too much. Like if I see stuff that's interesting and I can contribute, I will. But like, uh, it, it's not a goal. So, like, do you have a sense for your dream job? Is it Google? Is uh, it is it no, Microsoft? No, no. Is I, it the I, State I, Department? Is it? I, I don't like the word dream job or words dream job. Like okay. a job is work where you go to get money. Okay. Um, like what I would want to do with my life is have the money to never work and then just like teach math and science and stuff. That would be fun for you, just teaching math yeah. and science. Do you want to be an academic? Do you want to teach university math no. and science? I like people once. They're in university. Uh, they usually already know how to learn on their own, and like, but like, uh, I remember especially like when I moved to Utah, having no peers, no one to really like learn math from. Uh, so it'd be good. So I mean, you're saying your ideal would be just to kind of teach your, be an autodidact and teach yourself stuff in private? Huh? No, no, no. Like tutor or uh, teach at a high school. Just not college level yeah, in particular. Yeah. Teach kids math. Yeah. So do you want to be a high school teacher? Um, potentially. I haven't ever been a high school teacher. So, like, I, I've heard uh, horror stories about high school teaching. So, I mean, because most people yeah. who go to MIT don't want to teach high school math. They yeah, want yeah, to, yeah. like, work for Lawrence Livermore Labs in uh, Berkeley or... Oh, I wouldn't want to work for the government. Um, that, 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 that's a <laughs> whole other. Or Google and, you know, yeah, yeah. work for search engines or natural yeah. language technology or whatever. Yeah, that stuff would be interesting. But, like, uh, not, hmm. I, I, if I'm going to do something like that, I'd rather just do a startup. Your own startup. Yeah. And then there's the matter of money. A lot of people who go to MIT just want to make gazillions oh, yeah. of dollars. That bugs me so much. Why there's so many quantitative traders. What does that mean? Quantitative traders. Yeah. Oh, like the people on Wall Street or Oh, this like Wall Street. Jane Street. Uh what else is there? Don't you don't know. you don't like just sort of that no, cap arbitrage it, capitalist it, it, it's an evil industry. Like Wall Street? Yeah, yeah. They don't they don't give anything to the world. They just take. Well, the ability to raise capital is what allows businesses to invest and grow, right? So like quantitative trading is like the stock market uh stuff, right? Okay. Like that—that that doesn't raise any capital. Like, in, uh, so the initial IPOs are okay. Venture capitalists are a little better because they actually like give seed money. But like, tr quantitative traders are literally just like taking money from the stock market. Just arbitrage stuff. Yeah. Extracting. Yeah. You're just looking for differentials in in yeah. value. And it's not even interesting work. It's just like, it, it's yeah. Hmm. It, they just do what? What's it called? A linear regression. They just find the right variables to regress on and like, boom. But that's what they do all day. So what if somebody says, yeah, but like studying math all the time and teaching other kids math, that's almost recursive. Mm. You're, what, what value are you adding to yeah. humanity by just more and more people learning math? Yeah. So I think uh, with theoretical math, that's definitely true. Um, but like with applied math, where you can actually build stuff and like physics and all that stuff, like where you can make better technology. It's actually so, useful. So why not go work for Tesla or SpaceX and help build cool <laughs> stuff with your math? Uh, because I feel like uh, I would be a much better teacher than a worker. Hmm. And plus, like, yeah. Actually, 
Well, plus also like uh, Tesla doesn't pay, they, they pay their employees, well, sorry. These com big companies do pay their employees very well, but uh, compared to how much money they could make uh, just doing their own thing, uh, they don't get paid nearly as well as they could be. So you don't necessarily want to go help someone else make a lot of money. Yeah. If you're going to make money, you want to make yeah. good money. Make money for myself. For yourself, yeah. And mm -hmm. is that a possibility for you? Uh, probably. Yeah. I haven't actually like done anything in re regards to startups, but... I mean, you'll, you're about to be a sophomore in college, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> not yet. Hasn't done it yet. <laughs> Haven't done it yet. Margie, do you have questions, like, in terms of reconstruction that you, you want to ask? Hmm. I was kind of curious when you were talking about when John was asking about believing in God and some of those questions, and you kind of mentioned placebo. Mm. Um and kind of saying, you know, hey, it it can be a positive to feel like there's some something out there. Mm -hmm. It can, you know, I was curious if when you are talking about God or believing in some of those things or this even this idea of, oh, there's someone out there who is looking out for me. Do you feel loss around that? Do you feel neutral? Mm -hmm. Like, how does it make you feel now when you're when you are talking about? Yeah. Now, let's see. Now, I don't care too much. Like, for a bit, I felt lost. Um, now it's just like, whatever, this is life. Um, I'll just do what I want. Um, I did have one Nevermo friend uh, who said, who I, I asked uh, a little after my faith transition, like, what they believed the meaning of life was. And they're like, oh, it's just to have fun. Uh, to like do good and have fun. I'm like, okay. Uh, and I, I, uh, at first I didn't really believe that too much. Uh, I've grown more towards that position, just like to be a good person, have a good life. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, another thing is uh, people, I, I think part of the the reason people say it was the meaning of life uh, is it's the implied after you die. Uh, and I'm not convinced that I will ever die or will ever die in the next hundred years. Like, uh, technology has advanced a ton, so it's very possible that uh, cryogenics or even just like de-aging will come about within my lifetime. So there's always that. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing kind of a bit of present mindedness, like you're more oriented to the present moment than, because mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that too, coming from a place like Mormonism and how you described yourself of like living the steps, like you were in high school thinking about getting married, like, well, and right after, and that is such a big part of Mormonism is it's, it's like, it's all laid out. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's very future minded. You're always thinking about kind of the next kind of steps. What has the shift been like for you away from this idea of like knowing what your life is going to look like? Not that it ever really, you know what I mean? Not that it yeah. worked, worked, but like, ha, has that been a hard shift to, the, to move from this sense of like knowing or being given a structure for your life to sort of like, mm. nope, I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. So a question. Uh, there are some things that like, I know I want to do with my life, but uh, in general, I think I've met some good communities since leaving Mormonism where I know like I can just end up in a good community like that event. Or wherever I go, I'll do fine. So, like, at the rationality camps, met lots of smart people. And maybe I'll just, like, go hang out with them after college. Uh, or just, like, yeah. So, uh, much less. Also, I think uh, being at MIT has made me much less worried about the future. Because, like, I'm an MIT student. I can get a job pretty mm -hmm. much anywhere now. Even without graduating? I don't know about that. Yeah, it's probably a little harder without graduating. <laughs> so you are inclined to want to graduate. Um, there, that is the primary reason I want to graduate. I, I don't really like credentialism, though, so <laughs> I want to push back. What about uh, capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> what do I think about capitalism? <laughs> I haven't actually spent too long thinking about it. Uh, is Noam Chomsky still at MIT? 
Noam Chomsky. Never heard of him. Okay. I don't know. I'll Google. I don't I, know who that I is. I may have that wrong. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Uh, <laughs> in terms of capitalism, I think uh, there's no motivation for the people in power to uh, pay people well in capitalism. Uh, in mm-hmm. communism, there's no motivation for like workers to mm-hmm. work well. <laughs> um, so, like, I don't have super high opinion of capitalism, but like, uh, I, I don't yet know what a better system would be. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I I mentioned Noam Chomsky. He's an American professor and public intellectual known for his work in linguistics, political activism, and social criticism. Sometimes called the father of modern linguistics. Chomsky is also a major figure in analytical philosophy and one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. He's a lawyer, professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona and an institute professor emeritus at MIT. Mm. So maybe you can see if he's still around and uh, if you could meet Noam Chomsky before he kicks the bucket. Well, what what about Noam Chomsky? Like- uh, I think he's done a lot of deep thinking around the types of issues you're talking okay. about. So I think you might find him interesting. Maybe not. I okay. mean, when I was in MIT circles back when mm-hmm. I was working there, he's kind of a legend for MIT. Okay. So if you're a legend for MIT, you're, you know, he's one of the top intellectual thinkers, I think, that's ever been associated with MIT. Maybe. Okay. Check I was going to make a joke. What is it? But is he hard science or science? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Maybe he's not. <laughs> teasing you. But, like, I, I think... It, what really matters is uh, you have like axioms that you build up from, yeah. and that, that's what makes something rigorous. And like yeah. that's why biology is a little more wishy washy. They don't have like axioms. It's just proteins fold. We saw it happen, so that's what happens. <laughs> I'm curious too, as you've kind of, I mean, deconstructed in a way. Like, have <laughs> have you surprised yourself? Have other things fallen away? Like. Has it also made you think about if you really want to be married or partnered? Does it, yeah. or like, has it hit other things now where you're like, I actually don't know that? Yeah. So marriage is a big one. Uh, I, I, when I was Mormon, I'm like, absolutely need to get married by the time I'm like 22. Uh, now I'm like, I don't know if I ever even want to get married. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if uh, monogamy is a good thing. Like, it feels like now I'm like. Hmm. Maybe monogamy is actually uh, wrong because, like, you're pressuring the other person to only uh, only love you, when maybe they should be allowed to love anyone they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows? Mm-hmm. So two options: how happy you were when your parents were super proud of you, or at least mm-hmm. more proud of you than they are now when you had this fixed religious system, all these do's and don'ts, the scrupulosity of trying to control your thoughts, trying to control your desires, but a path laid out for you where you knew what was expected of you and what the purpose of life was Mm -hmm. and what you should and shouldn't think and believe. Happiness of that, being an Orthodox Mormon, versus happiness now, how would you evaluate your relative happiness? Mm. Or contentment Mm. or whatever word you want to use. Hmm. I need to think about this for a bit. Hmm. I think uh, nowadays I am more happy with uh, myself, um, more content with where life is leading, uh, more sure of who I am, what I want to do, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I would say I would was happier uh, back when I was Mormon. Because I knew everything. Um, I didn't have to worry. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not what people are going to want to hear. Some people are going to want to hear you're happier with yeah. the choices you've made. I mean, it's only been a little over a year. So, like... Give you some time. I, I haven't made very many choices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and the I happier think, with self thing is no small thing. Yeah. When you were saying you're, you feel happier with yourself. Also, I feel like uh, 10 years from now, I'll certainly be happier uh, outside of Mormonism than I would have been if I somehow stayed in Mormonism, Uh, especially if I somehow stayed in Mormonism while having serious doubts Uh, or like stayed PIMO. mm -hmm. Physically and mentally out. Like, yeah. What what I kind of heard is you saying that there's – 
there's a happiness that comes with certainty. Like mm -hmm. you said you like physics and math because it helps you understand reality. Well, if you're part of a system where you're convinced that you understand reality in its purest and truest form, mm -hmm. what I think you're saying is that even if it's fake, even if it's based on lies, you're happy because you feel like you know everything that yeah. matters, right? Yeah. You have certainty you know, over, over the reality of, of, of the world, even if it's totally false. Yeah. And like my entire future, I knew like, no matter what happened, like at least I'd go to heaven and be able to live eternally and ha with happiness, whatever that means. <laughs> but, but maybe we're not meant to be happy like that for our whole lives. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it's the unhappiness or the discomfort that motivates us to l try new things, to learn more, and to grow? Eh, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> How is it for you? Uh, Margie's got her mouth open now. No, I had a, a question, but I want to hear oh, his answer. Okay. Like, Why aren't you for that? That, that uh -oh. happiness can be like a, you know how um, whoever it was, Marx or whoever said that, Religion is the opiate of the masses, that it numbs your <laughs> unhappiness and, and makes yeah. you feel happy. So uh, when it comes to that, I think like in general, if things are too difficult, you're not doing them right. And they're like, uh, you're not like growing as much if it's too difficult. Um, like when you're running, you shouldn't be getting shin splits every, every other week. Mm -hmm. uh, like <laughs> it, it, it should hurt for a Bit, but like in a good way hmm. um and so like it should be a good struggle not like uh i'm feeling depressed uh all the time hmm. so i feel like the the downs are not really helpful parts of life but like sometimes you have to live through them hmm. okay so you're for constructive discomfort that leads to growth yeah and also like it should be something you choose to go through uh, otherwise, it's usually not going to help you grow the most. If it's like imposed on you by others. Yeah. Regardless of its truthful, actual truthfulness. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just like thinking about running again. Like when I choose to run up a hill, uh, it's a lot better than when I feel like I have to run up a hill because it's part of the workout. So you're saying free agency matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you agree with the church. <laughs> yeah. <'cause> well. Like, <laughs> the, <laughs> Did the church really? You can't have free agency without informed consent. <laughs> yeah. 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 And now you feel like you have a little bit more informed consent about life? Yep. Okay. Okay. I was curious if you feel like, I mean, sometimes the way you talk about math and what what math mm, gives you in a way, does it provide you a sense of like, I don't know, some solidity that you lost in Mormonism? Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like how, how you describe kind of this process of being given a problem and there's, a, there's actually a, a, oh. there's a place for you to, there's, a, there's, there's something- There's an answer. Like yes. At the bottom. Yes. And uh, you, it's like, you, you, didn't you mention it being like a, a sense for how things work and reality helping you? That's what hard science oh. kind of offers, so, ideally. Uh, I, I don't think it's like at all a replacement for Mormonism, but like, I think it's very nice to be able to like dig down and be a little more rigorous about stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's very good. Is but, it like grounding? Yeah, because like you can be a lot more confident that you're right about something if you can like prove it's right. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm. I hear some math sometimes when you when you talk about life. <laughs> so it's interesting, like that idea yeah. of like the simplest, the simplest way to that, and you describe that about the the math problem, the simplest but elegant way to go about a yeah. or and so it's just interesting i feel like math the way you approach it you see it in the way you approach life too yeah sometimes yeah mm -hmm. math is life <laughs> i don't know that <laughs> with, with an e or an a <laughs> <laughs> 
What do you mean? <laughs> like M E T H. <laughs> oh. <laughs> meth? Yeah. <laughs> no, math. Oh, okay. <laughs> are, are you really living if you're not on meth? <laughs> <laughs> or math. You're not living if you're doing it, math. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to do math to, to, to truly live. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, I think there's going to be a ton of people that really value your willingness to be open and honest. And just like um, James Camacho, just like you felt alone and were seeking friendship or support or validation, and just like you were able to find support, I think your episode is going to provide that for a lot of people that are trying to figure things out and not feel so alone mm -hmm. and or sad or isolated. So in that regard, I'm really grateful uh, you'd be willing to come on Mormon Stories. I'm sure your parents won't be super thrilled that you did this, right? <laughs> yeah. Who knows if they'll even find out. No, they'll probably find out. <laughs> yeah. But I just want to thank you for being willing to tell your story because I know it's going to help people. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Thanks. Any final words you want to share with uh, anyone who's watching? Any final wisdom or perspective? Um, let's see. I guess like uh, if you want to learn math, you should go to MIT OpenCourseWare. If you want to <laughs> learn physics, you should go to the Feynman Lectures. Other than that, not really. Where are those? The Feynman Lectures? Yeah. Oh, so Feynman was like one of the greatest physicists of all time. And uh, he was also a very good teacher. So he... Uh, he, he was a prof professor at Caltech in like okay. the seventies. Got it. Uh, and it, all his lectures were like recorded. Where can you find those? Uh, you can just like search up Feynman lectures, Caltech. Okay. And, like, and it's ocw.mit.edu. That one I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, good luck, James Camacho. Uh, I can't wait to, will you check back with us in five or 10 or 20 years? And um, No promise, but yeah. I'll, well, I hope you will. I'll try to remember. <laughs> and if people want to reach out to you, do you want anyone reaching out to you? And if so, how can they reach out to um, you? Let's see. Sure. People can reach out to me. Um, I'd be willing to teach most people math or science. Yeah. Um, Our son's really into math. That's yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that, actually. Um, how could they reach out to me? Uh, I'm very look upable online, unfortunately. So okay. you could look me up just like James Camacho, <laughs> MIT. You have an email address. Your is it your MIT email address that, or just like uh, Instagram? You'll or? probably find LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to reach out to James Camacho, reach out to him through LinkedIn. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, James. Uh, thanks for coming on Mormon Stories. Okay. And Margie, thanks for being um, co-pilot on yeah. this episode. It's great to have you. My pleasure. And thanks to everyone who makes this possible, Gerardo and Julia and Maven and the board. And most, most importantly, thanks to you listeners. Please share this episode. Please subscribe on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook. Um, please share these episodes. And uh, for those of you who donate to Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation, thank you. We couldn't pay all the staff and the resources facilities without your support. And if you're not a donor or supporter and you want to see this content continue, please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button and become a monthly donor. That's how we uh, keep the lights on. Uh, be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Learn math. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.